Sup y'all it's me it's yo boy fanfic audiobooks enjoy the story and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Also comment what you want to see next in the channel, let's start. Chapter 60, Mirror Mode Part 4, Fight with a Legend Grey was flat on his back, slowly shaking his head back and forth with a vague notion of shaking away the ringing in his ears. This sucks. The ice mage mumbled. Above him, the teen could see nothing but a hazy smoke, lingering low above his head. A small trail of blood dribbled down his chin, as he pulled himself back up into a sitting position. With a deep breath, the mage collected the coal to his skin, numbing his nerves and easing the ache that was pounding through his body. As the spots began to fade away from his vision, a dark shadow fell over him. Grey looked up to see the king's mechanical dragon's claws lifting upwards to smash him like an ant. This sucks. Grey mumbled again. Then the claws began their descend. Cursing loudly, Grey slammed one hand against the ground and held out the other towards the mech's face. Ice make, floor. Ice make, cannon. In one move, Grey turned everything beneath him slick then shot himself backwards across the ground from the force of his attack. The attack smashed down an instant after he broke clear, and Grey's attack struck the behemoth's face immediately after that. Grey's cannon shot struck the machine dead on, hammering it with enough force to punch straight through solid steel. Instead, the blast dissolved as it made contact, leaving behind a tiny wisp of water trickling down its face. The machine stepped forwards, eating up the space Grey had made with a single stride. A sphere of energy sparked up inside the thing's mouth, whirring loudly as it charged up its blast. Snarling, Grey brought up his arms and took a stance to summon the strongest shield he could muster. Fire Dragon's Iron Fist Natsu burst onto the scene like a comet, smashing the mech's jaw closed with a earth-rattling clang. A plume of light and smoke erupted from its mouth, as its own attack smashed into its teeth. Natsu landed hard next to Grey, grabbed him by the shoulder and charged headfirst into a large butterfly bush, and forced them both into the foliage before the king could regain his vision. What the hell was that man? Natsu whispered in his ear harshly. Quit playing around and hit the stupid thing. I've been trying. Grey replied angrily. My cold Excalibur disappeared the second it made contact. All of my attacks just melt when they land a hit. Literally nothing I do is working. It got some sort of anti-magic shield or something. Bull. I'm landing everything just fine. You're just not hitting it hard enough. That thing's a big, stupid, metal dragon, Natsu. You're a dragon slayer. Whatever it's blocking me with you're just going straight through it. I can't hit it. Seriously. I always knew you were useless. Just stay here and try not to piss yourself. I'll handle this on my own. Like hell. I'm not going to just sit this out. Well you ain't going to be doing any fighting if you can't hit him. Then I'll block. If I can't do any damage, I can at least slow him down and let you hit him. You handle offense, and I've got defense, all right. Grey glared at the pink-haired mage, daring him to disagree. Are you saying I can't take care of myself? You're really gonna be like this right now. Grey groaned, Natsu, we got bigger issues. Fine. Fine. Just don't get in my way. Shut up and go commit elderly abuse already, would you? I want to get home, so we can get to work rebuilding the town, again. Ah, don't be such a downer man. Maybe the city will magically put itself back together when we free everybody. I definitely wouldn't complain. Grey peered carefully around the foliage for a moment, watching as the dragon Mecha began tearing up the garden in its search for them. If the king is in the head, let's try and snap its neck. Right? Let's go. In a burst of flames, Natsu incinerated their bush, revealing the two mags standing tall just as the king turned his vehicle to search in their direction. Fire Dragon's Roar 
The spinning typhoon of fire crashed into the dragon's flank, leaving the metal cherry red at point of impact. Inside his dormer Anim, the king scowled deeply. The ice mage had proven just as ineffective as all of his alchemists had predicted, his magic as harmless to the great war machine as a light breeze. But the pink-haired one, that was dragonic magic. Dragons had left his kingdom long before he was born, but the records of what they had been capable of had been impressive. Old folklore stated that dragons were one of the few creatures that the Fae were hesitant to confront. Certainly, the archives showed that the Fae only began to truly invade their world once the dragons left. With that in mind, the king decided that he could safely ignore the dark-haired boy and turned his entire attention towards the dragon boy. He would be the deciding factor of this particular fight. Any other combatants were, at best, the slightest of distractions. The two teens split up, running in opposite directions at top speed. Waves of ice shot out across the courtyard, freezing the ground beneath his machine's feet. The king scoffed at the attempt. The mere action of putting a giant foot down on the magically created ice caused it to fade away into nothing without even a tiny dip in power. Another plume of flames washed over the dragon, staggering it once more. Frowning, the king flipped a switch in front of him, redirecting a portion of his stored power into the joints of his war machine. An instant later, what had once been a slowly meandering behemoth suddenly turned on the afterburners. The machine leapt across the yard, spinning sharply in midair, to bring down a crushing axe kick down towards the dragon slayer's head. Yelping in surprise, the fire mage dove out of the way, barely jumping clear before the metal leg kicked a crater into the ground where he had been standing. Shit! Natsu cried as the machine whirled around, arm already positioned for a second strike. As the arm began to descend, Natsu's eyes narrowed. A split second before the attack could connect, Natsu leapt up into the air, timing his jump so he landed right on top of the machine's arm. With a malicious grin, the dragon slayer charged straight up the machine's arm, hands blazing. I don't care how fast you are dumbass. You're still way too fat to ever dodge me. Grinning widely, the mage slammed both of his hands together right before he made contact with the mech's shoulder joint. Try out this. Fire Dragon's brilliant flame. The golden flame hit the titan's shoulder joint point blank. The explosion carried Natsu a hundred yards away, laughing manically, as he bounced across the yard. Inside of the mech, the king stared down in complete disbelief at the broken arm laying on the ground in front of him. A trail of molten metal trickled down the dragon's chest, hissing angrily the whole way as it tried to burn its way through the magical protections. A sharp buzz filled the air as the king slammed his hand down upon a speaker. The man's startled sputtering only served to stretch the dragon slayer's grin ever wider. You, impossible. That's impossible. The king raged. That's what everyone says when they start getting their ass kicked. Natsu crowed. Your imagination sucking doesn't mean I can't blast you and your stupid dragon suit to pieces. You damn child. You don't understand what you are fighting for. You're dooming my world. I think this place will get along just fine once we knock you out of power. That will never happen. I won't let my country fall. Energy started pooling inside of the mech's mouth once more and Natsu tensed, looking to dodge at the last second once more. Instead, a massive slab of stone sailed through the air and smashed down into the side of the machine's head. The king nearly fell from his seat from the force of the impact. With a frantic turn of a dial, the head swiveled to catch sight of Grey. The teen was positioned about a dozen feet in front of a hedge wall, hands on his hips beside an ice catapult. Behind him, part of the courtyard had been dug up, leaving a great crater in the ground. Once he saw the king's attention was fully on him, Grey set out a wave of ice towards the hedges at his back, waving cheerfully as the entire wall shattered, revealing dozens upon dozens of similarly loaded catapults. Figured if you were just blocking magic, physics should still work just fine. With a wave of his hand, 
Over a hundred boulders were launched high into the air. The king flicked another switch, wrapping the dragon's metallic wings around the body of the armor like a giant shield. The barrage of stone battered the wings, denting and crumpling them under several tons of rock. With a mad gleam in his eyes, the king thrust the wings aside the very instant the bombardment stalled, leaping towards the ice mage with every intent to rend him apart with the machine's talons. Then he saw that the boy had one final weapon still locked and loaded. Grey had created a giant crossbow before him, with the dragon down its sights and his hand on the firing mechanism. Loaded up into the machine sat Natsu atop a charred tree trunk that had hastily been carved into a makeshift missile. With a wide grin from his perch atop the smoldering wood, Natsu pointed directly at the rapidly approaching king. Fee-e-i-i-a. He cried out. Grey gave a mighty yank, and suddenly Natsu was airborne. His hands caught fire again, and as he closed with the king his arm wound back for another mighty blow. Then, his stomach noticed that he was riding a log through the air at high speeds. The dragon slayer's face instantly turned green, and the fire vanished from his hands as he desperately covered his mouth. The log slammed into the king, and Natsu was sent face first into the solid armor of the machine. With a pitiful whine, he dropped down to the ground as the king got into striking range of Grey. Well, that could have gone a whole lot better. Grey complained to himself as he slipped out of the way of a claw attack. Natsu! You lizard brain! Get your ass off the ground and start hitting this dumbass again. Grey scrambled around another attack, turning the ground to ice once more to boost his maneuverability as Dragon relentlessly tried to slice him in half. A blast of flame splashing into the machine's back, but the flames lacked the heat of the previous attacks. Natsu, as still trying to keep his stomach down, was barely able to control his flames. Cursing loudly, Grey slammed his palms against the ground once more. Ice make, Glacier. Rather than cast at the dragon, Grey cast at himself, summoning a massive wall of ice between him and his opponent. The dragon easily hacked the structure apart, but in the split second the king lost sight of his prey, Grey had vanished. Damn you! Spittle flew from the king's mouth as his enraged shouts echoed across the courtyard. His machine whirled around once more, searching for Natsu before the dragon slayer could vanish from his sights as well. He needn't have worried. The brief distraction was all the time that Natsu needed to pull himself together. Now, the teen stood with a snarl on his lips and fire dancing across his hands. I'm gonna pretend that didn't happen, if Icehead tells anyone, I'll deny it. He grumbled. I miss having Happy to fly me around. As he spoke, arcs of electricity began to mingle within his fire. The slits of his pupils turned reptilian, and scales began to grow around his eyes. But don't think for a second you can beat me in that stupid can. I'm Natsu Dragneel, son of Igneel, the strongest dragon of them all. You're just some idiot trying to fake it till you make it. Well, nobody here's impressed with your shitty cosplay. Now come on. Let's wrap this up. Lightning fire dragon mode. Roaring in rage, the king brought the mouth cannon of his war machine towards the dragon slayer yet again. This time. This time his attack would connect. This time, he would finally see the flesh from his target burn away from the bones. This time, he would finally, finally wipe the grins off these boys' smug faces. The bright metal of the Dorma Anim flashed, then darkened as all of the metal was slowly drained away from it. The metallic scales sucked in the light around them, dimming the very air surrounding the machine. Dorma Anim, Black SKY. The king cried. The great machine's full power exploded across courtyard, draining out what little remained of the light in the air, and leaving the cornea of Natsu's flames and electricity as the only spot of brightness. Yeah, that's the way. Give me everything you've got. Natsu cried out. With a wide grin on his face, Natsu leaned back and inhaled, filling his lungs to their absolute limits. Across from him, 
the king's cannon began gathering pitch black magic into its jaws. The air took on a dark purple hue as the malicious darkness leaked from the gathering blast. Lightning fire dragons roar. Dragon riders spread a cannon. Red and yellow met black and purple in a hellish clash that set the garden ablaze and melted the stones to slag. The collision of powers strained between the two of them, desperately struggling to send the power back down the throat of the opponent. Inside of his machine, the king could do nothing but wait and watch as his ultimate weapon reached its peak and tried to outlast the dragon slayer. Inch by inch it slowly pushed Natsu's attack backwards. Even as the core of the machine rattled and burned, even as the king squirmed in worry, the machine unleashed the full limit of its power battered against Natsu's attack. Natsu, however, had no such limit. Even as the attack pushed towards him, Igneil roared and raged inside of his mind. Laxus shouted a string of obscenities and threatening encouragement. And through it all, his own dragonic nature screamed at in defiance at this challenge to his authority as the successor of the Dragon King. Hiya! Scales erupted even further down Natsu's body, and in a suddenly torrent of power, the flaming electric mix sheared straight through the king's final attack and slammed into the false dragon with the wrath of a true monarch. Natsu's roar sheared apart the machine's defenses, annihilating every single one of its built-in barriers the second it made contact. The metal frame turned to liquid, and the systems fried. Inside his chair, the king screamed in helpless anger as his ultimate weapon fell in a heap, halfway melted to the ground. Mumbling inaudibly to himself, the king fumbled with his chair's harness frantically. Nightwalker, he had to get back to Nightwalker and her beast. She would have dealt with the wretched Fae by now. Her beast could handle these two as well. As he rose from his seat and turned to flee, the old man turned directly into a palm that was thrust harshly into his chest. A rush of ice encased his body from the neck down, and suddenly the monarch was well and truly stuck. Hopped in through the armhole when you were smashing up my glacier. Gray reported smugly. Decided to let you and Natsu duke it out before I came in to bag you. A quick jab dislodged the king's feet from the floor, and Gray began to drag him towards the hole. Just insert on ice pun here, I guess. Gray remarked. If you hadn't taken my home, I might have felt bad about all the frostbite. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
waiting to see if his tests would be enough to make him realize his new status and talk with them. After a few more seconds of inspection, the cat looked up at the two girls crouching down at his sides, completely ignoring Happy altogether. Then he let out a burst of magic, startling them. His muscle swelled and his body twisted, bringing the exceed from its tiny stature up to someone who could tower over either girl. A fist buried itself into each blonde's stomach, lifting them into the air and throwing them backward, as an enraged howl escaped the exceed's lips. Faust. The beast man roared as he slammed both of the girls against the wall by their throats. I'm coming for you, Faust. You'll bleed for this. I'll tear your limbs from your body, leaving you as a helpless wretch, then set you ablaze to hear your screams. Then I'll... The Exceed's rant was cut short by twin bursts of light from each of his hands. He snapped out of his rant just in time to get slammed back into the opposite wall of his cell. Lee's Anna massaged her throat lightly, now hovering in her harpy form. Her talons had slashed the cat man's grip and allowed her to kick herself free. Across from her stood another grey Exceed. Gemini, who? Lucy croaked clutching at her throat and coughing. His name is Panther Lily. The Exceed beside her said. He was the soldier picked by the Exceed Queen to work within the King's army to try and facilitate communications between the two kingdoms. The original Catman growled like a panther at the sight of the duplicate and stalked forward and pounced. There was a burst of light and Loke appeared, catching the incoming punch with one hand, adjusting his glasses with the other. Hang on a second there big guy, nobody is looking for a fight right now. Loke looked down and winced at Panther Lily's shape. Tell you what, calm down and we can get you some food. You look like you could use it. He turned back toward Lucy. Are you all right my? Lee's Anna. Is that you, he blinked. Hey Loke. Lee's Anna smiled, then frowned. Wait, are you a spirit? He opened his mouth to answer, but was cut off as Panther Lily snarled and struck out at him. Loke vanished in a burst of light, and a cloud of pink wool erupted into being. Panther Lily's fist buried itself in the wall and stuck fast. Ah, sorry. Ares mumbled, standing beside Lucy. But you shouldn't attack us. We are, um, not your. Panther Lily snarled, and attempted to lunge for them, I'm sorry, the spirit shrieked, throwing up her hands and making the wool cloud expand until only the cat's head was showing. Panther Lily opened his mouth to roar, but paused, a drowsy look crossing his face as he slumped into the wall. In the silence that followed, Gemini continued to speak. He was captured here the night before the attack on his homeland, and he has been trapped here since. The king has been using him to try and learn about the locations of all of the dragon slayers of your world. Ah, how would he know that? Lee's Anna asked. Gemini tapped their paw against their face. Apparently, for each trueborn dragon slayer, the Exceed Queen sent down one of her children to watch them and monitor their progress. The dragon slayer magic, has a corrosive effect on what little magics there is in this land. It tears through defenses, crushes a fence, and can cut clear through any curse. The lacrima that your guildmates are trapped in, if exposed to dragonic magic, will unlock and free everyone inside. Lysanna's eyes went wide. It's really going to be that easy, she demanded, her voice hoarse. Just get Natsu over to this lacrima, and we've got the entire guild here to help us with the king's men. That's brilliant, she grinned. Where do we have to go? He'd keep it close to here right. If his forces are all concentrated around the city, the lacrima has to be nearby too. Lee's Anna laughed and began to look around, as if she could spot the lacrima in one of the nearby cells. Lucy smiled as well and nodded silently at her spirit. In a puff of white light, Gemini transformed, reverting back to a pair of floating blue twin spirits. He doesn't know much about the command structure around here anymore. The spirits spoke in two voices. 
All he knows is that if anyone could tell you where the lacrima is, it would be either the king or night walker. King. Lucy and Lee's Anna said in unison. If night walker was anything like their Urza, they were better off staying as far away from her as possible. Loke poofed back into the room, holding a platter of meat. He glanced at Gemini and Ares and whistled. Wow, princess, three spirits at once. You don't even look winded, he grinned and held the platter in front of Panther Lily's face. The exceed still looked sleepy, but his nose twitched and his neck strained forward. Loke held the plate closer, and the cat buried his face in the plate. Messy chewing noises filled the air for a few moments before the exceed swallowed the mouthful. He looked more awake now, his eyes examined them and Lucy got the impression he was only just now actually seeing them. Panther Lily turned his eyes to Happy. You, were you one from the group that was sent down to the dragons? He asked slowly. Happy nodded his head somewhat nervously. Panther Lily regarded the blue cat for a moment before sighing. I see. That's right, the ones we sent away. He closed his eyes. We are not yet extinct, he murmured. His eyes snapped open. The rest of you, you are not with the king. Definitely not. Lucy said. Then I owe you an apology. But I also ask that you release me. I will not attack you again, but I must find the king. Lee's Anna and Lucy glanced at each other. If we do, you can't kill him. We need to get him to tell us where our friends are. Panther Lily's eyes glittered. I will restrain myself, for now. But he will pay. No problem, we only need him for a little bit. After that. Lucy shrugged. He's all yours. Ares, the ram spirit nodded and the wool-holding panther Lily disappeared. Thank you. The cat man nodded, as he stood and moved for the door. One thing to keep in mind is that we must avoid Nightwalker and her pet. Nightwalker is the one who captured me when the king turned on my people, and her power will have flourished while my own waned in my confinement. If we should encounter either of them, we must flee. No reason to worry about that. Lee's Anna said. Our world has our own Urza, and she's on our side. She's fighting her double right now alongside my big sister. They should be able to beat her no problem, and I bet our Goku can handle yours too. Our group is actually the weakest one running around the castle right now. I bet our friends can handle anything the king throws at them. There's no chance at all that Natsu will lose, ever. We won't need to be worried about them, all we have to do is figure out where the king went. If the king is being hunted by your friends, then he will likely flee to the garden to his war machine. If your friends have not captured him yet, then he will be lying in wait in there. Oh, if he set a trap then those two have definitely sprung it by now. Lucy groaned. Those two better not have gotten themselves into trouble. Come on Lucy, it's Natsu and Grey. Even if the king caught him off guard, I bet he's already trussed up and waiting for us. Wordlessly, Panther Lily began to jog away. The girls quickly followed him out of the prison and down the hall, with Happy flying ahead to hover over the larger Exceed's head, murmuring questions as they moved. The blue cat didn't look like. He was living up to his namesake at the moment. Lucy caught Lee's Anna frowning at the cat and scrambled for something to distract her. I'll take that bet. Lucy said, interrupted whatever thoughts Lee's Anna had been so engrossed in. About Natsu and Grey being all done, I bet you we have to bail them out of some completely ridiculous situation that's would make Urza slam their heads together if she saw. Wait, seriously? You actually want to bet? Lee's Anna asked. Yep. You're so sure Natsu's going to be fine right? What'll it hurt if you're sure? Hum, you know, now I'm starting to see the resemblance between you and this world's Lucy. She always trying to pull one over on people. Lee's Anna smirked. However, you're right. 
I bet you that Natsu is going to be totally fine and the king will be caught, and you bet that we'll need to save him from something embarrassing, right? Unless this place has a random roller coasting in the middle of the castle or something, there's no chance he'll mess up a fight like that. I don't know if he was different as a kid, but I guarantee there will be something dumb going on when we get there. Loser has to do a dare. Sound like a fair wager. Deal. The party moved through the castle quickly, Panther Lily leading the way through the narrow twists and turns, straight through an amusement park. Lucy smirked at Lee's Anna when they saw there was, in fact, a roller coaster sitting in the middle of the castle. The takeover mage pointedly ignored her. Eventually up a flight of stairs that took them outside. What had once been a relatively nice-looking garden was now a torch disaster. Any places that didn't have a scorch mark over it was covered in ice, and a massive slab of ruined metal vaguely resembling a dragon had crushed a variety of formerly well-tended flowers. Hanging upside down off of one the dragon's wings was the king of Edolas. The man was soaked and shivering, tied up with thick vines and left dangling a half dozen feet above the ground. Gray sat on the ground a few feet away from him, hands in his face to hide his laughter. Natsu was yelling at the old man, and then smacking him upside the head with a stick. Where are our friends? Silence. Smack. Where are they? Smack. Did Gray freeze off your tongue? Say something, bastard. I'll light the stick on fire. I'll totally do it if you don't talk. Smack. Well, Urza would definitely hit them for that. Lucy noted as they walked across the clearing towards the duo. True, but you said that we'd have to rescue them. They won the fight, and if anybody needs rescue here, it's probably the king. I think that's a win for me. Fine, Lucy rolled her eyes. Great. I look forwards to watching you flip Urza's next slice of cake right into her face. The takeover mage said cheekily before dashing ahead to Natsu's side. Wait, what? Hey, I agree to dare, not suicide. The fire and ice mags heard the shriek and turned around to see the approaching group. Happy. Natsu beamed. Who is your new friend, buddy? I am Panther Lily, a former soldier for the king, and a long-time prisoner at his order. The exceed growled. Hello, your majesty. Faust looked over at the cat man with the same completely blank face that he had been giving Natsu and Gray since they had captured him. I see. The old man said tiredly. So, yet another of my choices comes to confront me. Hello, Panther Lily. You have ravaged this world. Panther Lily declared. You have spread death and destruction across the world in your desperate schemes. It ends today. Tell us where the lacrima is. Desperate schemes, the king scoffed. It is easy for an exceed to dismiss our plight, your kind were naturally equipped to escape the phase machinations. But the rest of the world. The man sighed. I truly cannot save it, can I? Not as I am. Not when the world balks at the choices necessary to steer it away from its destruction. No matter how hard I try, the citizens seem determined to sprint straight towards the end. He shook his head. The defiant, magic-guzzling lemmings. I am so very tired of having to try and halt them. So tired. The king closed his eyes. Children of the untarnished world, you will find what you are looking for about a mile above our heads on one of the islands floating around us. Which island should be abundantly clear once you bring yourselves up to the proper height? He opened his eyes. Now go. What Panther Lily and I have to discuss does not concern you. Wow, Grey whistled, glancing at the exceed. Don't know who you are, but just being here was enough to get the old bastard to talk, said to the towering exceed. Thanks. I did nothing, Faust's choice was his own. Panther Lily replied. However, I would appreciate it if you would honor his request and leave me here with him while you go to retrieve your comrades. 
My words for him are, long overdue. The fairies glanced at each other and shrugged, summoning up whatever magic they could to get them to the sky. Natsu and Happy quickly paired off, while Lee's Anna struggled with the combined weight of both Grey and Lucy. The fairy tale mags took off into the sky towards the nearest visible island, and all collectively froze at the sight on the opposite side of the castle. A great golden dragon roared out its challenge towards a growling armored monster. Panther Lily and King Faust stared down one another in silence. The blazing rage of the Exceed's eyes was met with the cold dispassion of the humans, and neither wavered in face of the other. Finally, after a long moment, Panther Lily used his claws to tear up parts of the metal of the ruined war machine until he was able to brandish a makeshift sword into the air. I, Panther Lily of Her Majesty's Royal Knights, find you, Faust, of being guilty of the genocide of my people and the death of my queen. If you have any last words, this will be your only opportunity to speak them. If you are hoping that I will grovel or beg, I shall have to disappoint you. The king replied, I always knew that I would face judgment for what I have done. My only regret is that I faced them before I could finish my mission. The king closed his eyes and raised his head high, exposing his neck to the exceed. All I can do now and hope, and pray, that the next generation will be able to pick up where I left off and save our dying world. Nightwalker and Kakarot, I leave the future of this world to the pair of you. And so, King Faust spoke his last. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
she hoisted her friend up over her shoulders. Right then, guess we are done here Urza. Let's just. I'm hoping this turns out all right. With that, Myra Jane shifted into her Satan soul and started to jog away, too tired to even try and take to the skies. The fight was out of their hands now. A short distance away, Nightwalker stared in disbelief as Goku's power exploded. This, yes, this person was Kakarot's analog but, this power. Could, could Kakarot actually, lose? Forgotten behind her, Launch quietly began to dangle a feather underneath her nose. Lunch emerged just seconds later, and the blue-haired young woman wasted no time at all hopping onto Nimbus and taking flight far, far overhead above the battle. Of the group from Fairy Tail, she would be the only person to bear witness. To the fight from start to finish. Kakarot glared down his armored snout at the glowing insect floating in front of his face. Goku glared right back with his blank eyes. His body was still visibly trembling as he tried to hold in his rage, but every passing moment that he stood facing his counterpart only served to weaken his control. Why was he holding back his rage from destroying this monster? The reason seemed to be slipping farther and farther away. Likewise, Kakarot's mind struggled against his animalist urges to tear his armor away and swat the thing that had dared to hurt him. This glowing, golden not black thing that had dared to challenge his dominance. The tension could only hold for so long, their desires only suppressed for a few moments. The two barely took a second to size one another up before they threw themselves at their other with everything they had. Despite his massive size, the speed with which Kakarot moved made the behemoth look like a blur to all but the most skilled of fighters, throwing a haymaker with such force that its mere wake shattered nearby buildings to rubble. Gur, Gra. Goku screamed at the incoming attack. His KI responded to his rage, bubbling up around him into a whirling, pulsating sphere. Kakarot's attack smashed into him at full strength and came to a complete stop once again. The beast man shouted and strained, trying to push Goku back away, but the KI shield resisted his efforts. Goku allowed his opponent to strain himself against the barrier for a few moments, then launched an attack of his own. In a flash, the sphere in front of Kakarot vanished, and a golden red missile slammed full speed into his chest. The one, solitary blow sent cracks splintering up and down the armor and forced the giant back several thunderous steps. Reeling in pain, Kakarot swung again, trying to swat away the glowing warrior, only for Goku to easily avoid the blow, get in right in front of his armored jaw, and land an uppercut so fierce that Kakarot was knocked off his feet and onto the ground once again. Using the momentum, Kakarot turned the fall into a backwards roll, gathering energy to his jaw as he moved. The instant his feet hit the ground, the Uzuru fired back with a titanic blast of K.I. In response, Goku reared back his fist. The aura surrounding the rest of his body shrank away, leaving behind a narrow film around his skin while the vast majority concentrated itself around his clenched fist. As the beam came close, Goku thrust out his fist, and a massive pillar of flames exploded outwards. The golden flames crashed into the beam with a great roar, consuming the beam as it raced towards Kakarot's open mouth. At the last second, the pillar of flame pulled up from the Uzuru, and from deep within the light emerged a massive golden dragon. The construct of golden KI roared as it extended to its full length, wrapping around the tallest buildings in the city to glare down at the armored monster beneath it. The battle within the city suddenly turned silent, as two legends stared each other down. Kakarot shouted his defiance towards the heavens. The dragon roared right back and, in a movement like lightning, struck down at the great ape with all the wrath of a god. As the blow came down, Kakarot's body erupted in a crimson aura of his own and swung at a punch harder and faster than any he had unleashed before. The world turned golden. Every person in the city had to shield their eyes from the brightness of Goku's unleashed attack lest they risk going blind. Urza Nightwalker was the first person to risk opening her eyes, and did so just in time to see the great chest plate falling towards her head. 
The knight dove out of the way just before the multi-ton slab of metal cratered into the ground. It took her brain a few seconds to process the item that had nearly crushed her, and a handful after that to realize what it meant. Eyes wide with worry, the redhead scanned her surroundings. When they found their target, a sigh of relief escaped her lips. Kakarot was still standing. The armor had been stripped away, the thick fur across his torso had been fried away to reveal a bare, burnt torso. But even with all of the damage, the glow of the warrior's kaya ken still burned. Lips pulled back in a challenging sneer, Kakarot held up a gigantic middle finger towards his opponent. Goku still hovered in the air across from the Uzuru, looking no worse for wear from the clash. The only visible change to his appearance was his shirt, now tatters from the explosion. With a careless huff, Goku ripped off the garment and tossed it into the wind. His body still throbbed with rage and power, his aura still burned a bright gold to contrast his red hair, and his power hadn't seemed to dip. There was a flash of light, and Goku's foot slammed into the back of the giant's head. Kakarot yelped in pain and whirled around, a giant fist whistling around to swat him a wire. Goku darted back just out of reach and letting Kakarot overextend and stagger off balance. Then, with a mighty heave, he latched onto the nearest finger and twisted around. Kakarot yelped in surprise as he was lifted off of the ground and Goku began to spin him around in the air. The giant made three full rotations around the glowing yellow figure before Goku let go and sent the Uzuru flying straight into the crumbling castle. The giant crashed into the already weakened foundations, and with a great moan the castle crashed down atop him. In an explosion of red K.I., Kakarot annihilated the debris that dropped on top of him and blitzed towards Goku at full speed. As he came, Goku could see Kakarot's body swelling even larger under the effect of the Kaya Ken. The giant beast blurred even faster than before, fast enough this time to get close to Goku before he could dodge clear. A massive fist crashed into the fighter and sent him straight through the street and beneath the cobblestone. Kakarot's foot crashed down on Goku's position a second later, turning a small hole into a crater. Kakarot yanked his foot out of the hole quickly, having learned his lesson about letting Goku grab onto him more than once this battle so far. Instead, a blast of K.I. spewed out from his jaw and vaporized the entire street. Houses vanished in a bright flash, Debris filled the air, and the nearby fighters scrambled out of the way to keep clear from Kakarot's wrath. Before the light of Kakarot's attack could even fade from the air, an equally bright blue beam burst forth from the ground and caught the monster straight in the gut. The Uzuru was lifted off of his feet and carried backwards into another large building, howling with rage and pain the whole way. Unlike Kakarot's beam, this one didn't let up pushing the giant further and further back with each passing moment even, as it threatened to burst through break through his body and tear him asunder. The red aura flared even greater than before, and with a mighty cry Kakarot slammed his hands together into the beam. The attack shattered like glass as the force of the monster's clap collapsed even more of the buildings surrounding them. Goku emerged from the ground looking completely unfazed. His eyes held a blazing red anger that not even his normal love for combat was able to quench. All techniques besides from the most basic had fled from his mind in the face of this anger, and tactics tumbled to the side in favor of pure might. Once more the warrior blurred forwards, aiming a sharp kick towards the back of the giant's head. Kakarot, despite his own animalist wrath, still had enough sense to recognize a repeated technique. The monster's hand came up just as Goku reappeared to lash out at him, and the giant caught the blow on his palm with a snarl. Before Goku could pull back, that same palm turned purple as blue K.I. mixed with red. A blast shot forth from the giant's hand, a sphere the size of his head that rushed off towards the distance, crossing over the entire city in a second before eventually slamming into a mountain head on a handful of seconds beyond that. The few that tracked the high-speed attack witnessed, as a huge flare of light consumed the skyline of the horizon. When the light faded, the mountain had vanished from sight. For a split second, Kakarot felt a tingle of satisfaction run down his spine. 
Then a kick to the back of the head knocked him into a tumbling roll across the battleground once again. Goku stared down at the giant with an earth-scorching glare. The fighter had ridden the blast all the way into the mountains, his KI shielding him from the contact with it, and had blitzed away at the last moment, breaking free the exact instant the blast had detonated and darting away before it could do worse than graze him. This time, when Kakarot stood, Goku was able to gather his focus well enough to realize that the aura of the Kaya in had began to shiver and shrink. Even as the great ape, the godly technique could only be maintained for so long. Undeterred even as his body began to break down, Kakarot roared out his challenge yet again. Goku responded in kind. Goku fired a barrage of KI blasts at the beast as it rushed in, then dodged up over its head as it rushed through the barrage and tried to land a hit. As the monster swung upwards to continue its attack, Goku flew right back down, slamming into the top of Kakarot's elbow. There was a wet squelch as the joint popped from its socket. The beast roared as its arm went limp and tried to lash out with the opposite arm. Goku again twisted out of the way, firing more blasts down the length of Kakarot's arm as it went past. He followed up by ramming straight into the monster's chest before its arm could swing back around, staggering it. As Kakarot tried to retaliate again, Goku vanished from his sight and delivered another blow to the back. When Kakarot spun to strike, a blow caught him in the side of his head and nearly dislocated. His jaw. As Kakarot stumbled back in pain, another blow to the back of the knee brought the giant down onto all fours. As it tried to regain its footing yet again, Goku appeared right behind its back. Twin beams of light twisted out of the fighter's hands like whips, wrapping around the giant's torso before he had a chance to recover. With a mighty heavy, Goku used his KI tendrils and lift the giant straight up into the air. His muscles bulging, the warrior rotated himself backwards in midair, twisting Kakarot over his shoulder, aiming the giant's head straight down, and then plummeting down together with all of his speed. The pair crashed down with enough force to drive Kakarot into the ground up to his shoulders. Goku flew clear as the Uzuru flopped limply to the ground onto his stomach. Goku eyed the fallen form for a brief moment, before completely ignoring the beast's stirrings, his eyes turned to the tail. Effortlessly, the red hair fight flicked a spinning KI disc at the limb and sliced it cleanly from Kakarot's body. Howling in impotence and rage, Kakarot began to shrivel and shrink, turning down to his normal size once more. Naked and burnt, with one arm still bent at an awkward angle, Kakarot glared up at the golden glowing figure from the bottom of the crater. Flying above, Goku's raised his fist, the power building up in time with the savage elation of victory. Ki gathered into his fists once again, and with a loud cry, he descended down from the clouds at top speed. Moments before the fatal collision, a flash of red jumped between the two mirrored men. No! cried Urza's voice. The sound of Urza's voice, so filled with desperate horror, cut through the fog of rage like a knife. The sight of the red hair before him, about to be crushed by his power filled him with horror and Goku forced himself to a stop, his hand jerked up, discharging the gathered power into the sky like a second sun. As energy dissipating and the light faded, Goku felt, strange, like a wet towel wrung completely dry. It was as though he had discharged all of his rage along with his KI, leaving him feeling resting in a sense of calm. He blinked at the figure before him and realized it wasn't his Urza, it was Nightwalker. The soldier was standing before him, her hands outstretched as though to shield the broken figure behind her. She wasn't holding her spear, it was lodged in the ground several meters away. They stared at each other for a long moment, then, when Goku made no movement to attack, Nightwalker turned and crouched over the fallen warrior. He whined at her and she shushed him, placing on hand on dislocated arm and offering her scarf with the other. Kakarot nodded and bit down on the cloth, as she gave the arm a sharp jerk and pushed it back into place. Kakarot gave a muffled hiss and looked past her to Goku. No. Nightwalker said. It's over, Kakarot. Goku stared at them for a moment, 
then turned his head and pushed out his KI senses. He didn't have much left, that, whatever it was had left him bottomed out. But he could just barely sense his Urza. She was still alive and stable, as were all of the rest of his friends. They were also all, in the sky. He glanced up, there was another of those floating islands overhead. They must be up there. Also, he could see Nimbus putting around, Lunt's nervous face poking out over the cloud. He turned attention shifted to his counterpart. He had been about to kill Kakarot. He probably still should. But, the rage was gone, he didn't really, care anymore. Provided neither he, nor Nightwalker tried something, he just didn't feel like fighting anymore. If I hadn't stopped, you'd be dead. He commented. I am aware. Nightwalker answered. She had rolled Kakarot upright, and left him sitting against the wall of the crater. She turned back to face him. I could not stand by and do nothing while Kakarot died. That was, respectable. Goku tilted his head to one side, regarding his double for a moment before speaking. If he's anything like me, he'll live. He said. His tail will grow back too. Mine did a bunch of times. Thank you. Nightwalker mumbled back to him. But this fight is over now, right? You know you lost. I know. You've won. Your city shall live. My world shall not. The knight replied darkly. Goku looked her over again, then moved to sit down on a nearby boulder. Nightwalker watched him warily, but made no comment as he sat a day. Tell me why this happened. Goku told her. Why did you two do all this? From what I've seen, the only thing that's a threat to this world is the king. What's happening to this place that has you so worried? Nightwalker scrutinized Goku's face for a few seconds then sighed. Well, if you truly wish to know. Taking a moment to collect herself, the knight began to speak. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He would turn away whenever he caught sight of me, would not even acknowledge me. When he turned back, I stayed with him. Where else did I have to go? Then the royal knights came to hunt us for what he had done and we fled. We traveled around for months, training together, living together, we were all the other truly had. I still miss those days. We didn't know it was the full moon that triggered the transformation at the time, and it happened several times because of that. But each time he ran less wild, getting control over it. He would just sit there, staring at the moon and wait for it to set. Then one night when we slept outside, staring up at the stars, the king found us. He had personally led a hunting party and tracked us down, determined to stop us. However, when he discovered that Kakarot's power was not magical, his attitude changed. He approached us on his own, unarmed, and when he found the pair of us sitting together in a berry patch, he got down on his knees, bowed down, and begged us for our service. Neither of knew what to make of it. He told me, told us, of what had happened to the world. Magic in this world is disappearing. It is happening slowly, so slowly that most people don't believe it is actually happening. But it is. But it's not just running out. It's being stolen. The magic of the world, the very lifeblood of the planet which allows us to live, is getting taken away and people don't even know that they should be afraid. Over a century ago, our world stared down the barrel of a potential annihilation similar to the one your Urza described. A demon was approaching, one that could see our world dead or enslaved. In desperation, a young woman, a knight, went out on her own summoned a fay. A Titania. The knight begged the creature for aid, for power to save this world. The fay agreed, saying that all it would need in turn was magic. With the fay's power, the woman took on a form similar to the one your Urza used, and after a lengthy battle she was able to save our world. And in doing so, she doomed us all. When the Fae asked for magic, she meant all of it. For the past century now, magic has been being siphoned away from this world and into the world of the Fae. It isn't even possible for us to reach them to try and barter or battle, their realm is simply beyond ours. The magic that holds the islands up in the sky, that sustains our plants and wildlife, they are taking it. Already, thousands of miles of what was lush and fertile lands has become arid deserts. I'm sure that you saw in your journey here how the greenery gives way in some places so quickly for dead land. That's them. That's the Fae. Every bit of magic that is being used in this world, whether it be for good, evil, or even just recreation, is only furthering the drain of a very limited resource. In less than a decade from today, there will be nothing left and this world will become a barren wasteland. The king has been trying desperately to resolve the situation, to reverse what the Fae have done and save our world. To do so, he cast aside all morals, all laws, and embraced the motto, whatever it takes. History could judge him a monster. He was fine with that, provided he could make sure that there was a world left for such a history to be recorded. The king and the Exceed Queen were in secret talks behind closed doors. The king begged the queen to limit her subjects, to have them cut back on using the magic that they were born with to try and buy our world a few precious extra years while he worked towards a solution. The queen refused at every level to restrict her people's freedom, even when the king told her that at their present pace, the exceed species would bring about the end of our world in less than three years from that date. We learned later that, because the exceed had natural magic, they could travel through the anima to other worlds. She was intending to fly herself and her people from our dying world and leave us to our fate. The king himself banned as much magic within his borders as he felt he could safely to try and avoid a rebellion, but it was nothing compared to what the exceed were burning through. Kakarot was a godsend for the king. A weapon that he could wield against all of the magic users without worrying about hastening the world's destruction. The king begged us to help save our world from itself, to harden our hearts and to fight for him. I'm not even sure Kakarot knew what he was being asked except to fight, 
he had no idea of the ramifications of what he might do. But I did. I listened, I believed our king, and I asked Kakarot to fight along with me. Kakarot destroyed the Exceed, and in doing so he extended the lifespan of this world by over ten years. In that time, the king discovered how the Fae were taking the magic. Their world is a parasitic one. It latches onto other worlds and drains the magic away like a tick. Our researchers even discovered how to counter it. However, it required an absolutely massive surge of magic, one so great that our world couldn't hope to produce it anymore without dealing our world its death blow. So, we look to your world instead. We used some our final stores of magic and took your city and all the people and magic within it and turned them into a lacrima. Its detonation would have showered out world with magic burned away the phase grip hold on our world and forcing them to come back to this world if they hope to finish us. Knowing that, the king prepared a response. I became the fairy hunter. Not for that guild helping you invade our city like they would have you believe, but because I have been entrusted with this spear. The Ten Commandments the only magical weapon currently within the realm with the capacity to kill a fae. With Kakarot at my side, the pair of us would fight the fae wherever they appeared and save this world once and for all. Instead, you came. You came, and we have fallen. Everything that we have worked for is in ashes, and now we shall be forced to watch as everything around us crumbles to dust as we choke on it. You may say that we deserve it if it pleases you, but for us it was merely a last, desperate chance for survival. One that has now forever failed. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
You two aren't done yet. He said with a sudden ferocity. Nightwalker's head whipped around. But you just agreed, Dash. Eternal Dragon, by your name I summon you forth. Rise Shenron. Memeize those words, right now. Goku ordered. Your world isn't dead yet. What? He pointed at the glossy orb in her hands. That's a dragon ball. One of seven. When I came to Earthland, I arrived in the same kind of flash of light that Kakarot did here. The dragon balls all came with me. If anyone can collect all seven, they can then say those words and summon forth a dragon god that can grant any wish. You can ask him to break the phase hold on your world, perhaps even undo the damage they've done altogether. Nightwalker stared at him for a long time, something flickered in the back of her eyes. You, are serious? Yeah. We used them to bring back a dead friend of ours once. If he can bring the dead back, closing some gate thing should be easy. Can he truly overpower them in such a way? I'd bet one dragon god over a fairy any day of the week. He speaks the truth. A new voice suddenly interrupted. Nightwalker and Goku turned to find Mistigan stalking towards them. Mistigan. Goku blinked. Nice of you to finally join us. Prince Jellal. Nightwalker jolted. Wait. Goku blinked, he's a prince. I may have agreed with my father on the ends, but never the means. I have been searching for my own way to save our world. I learned of little that could help, however the magic of the dragon is very real. If we can find it and unleash it here, this world can still be saved. Mistigan stared straight into his father's most loyal soldier's eyes. My father is dead. But this world is not. You are not. I am not. And if we can find those orbs, if we can summon that dragon god, we will remain that way. My father's lifelong goal is still within reach, so long as we are willing to strive towards it. Will you agree to serve me from this day forward and help me make one more attempt at this world's future? Nightwalker didn't even a moment to think before snapping to attention. The king is dead. Long live the king. She declared to the heavens. A weary smile graced the older man's face. Good. Best get to it then. We have no idea where any of the others are, and we have a time limit to beat. The fighting in the city came to a halt the moment Kakarot fell. Take him to the nearest healer that you can find, and get him back in fighting shape. The instant he is able to move under his own power, I am sending you out to begin your hunt. I don't want to see you or your partner back in this city until the day you've collected all seven orbs and are ready to save this world, is that clear Solida? Yes sir. She saluted smartly. Mistigan nodded and turned his attention back to his Earthland comrade. I'm sure this isn't what you expected out of me when you threatened me those months ago. Can't say I was sure what to make of you back then. Goku replied. Only that you were hiding too much. And in the end, I was. Thank you for your assistance today, son Goku. He looked away. Perhaps I should have asked for your help sooner. All of you. This entire mess could have been avoided if I had just been forthright from the beginning. I could have spared the people of this city so much suffering. But, thanks to you, I still have a little hope left for this world. For now, you should return to your own. A sudden flare of light burst to light far up above their heads. Both Goku and Jello looked up to see a massive lacrima floating up in the air, suspended over the city. Then, in a great burst of light it vanished off into the distance, rocketing straight back towards the portal to Earthland. Watching the city-sized crystal fly off over the horizon, Jello began to smile. Natsu has unleashed his magic on my father's prison, and your friends were all released back to your own world. The only ones who are still here are the rescue team. I'm sure that your sensory abilities will make tracking them down easy for you. Go to them son Goku, 
and make sure you save your world like you might have saved this one. With a nod and a wave, Goku took the Ten Commandment spear and leapt into the air, crying out for Nimbus. Lunch yelped as she was whisked over towards the leaping teen, though her startled cry was drowned. Out by the fighter's laughter as he waved goodbye. The pair made their way towards the rest of the group, and within the hour they had flown themselves all the way back to the portal they had entered the day before. Magnolia was resting where it always had, as though it hadn't gone anywhere, although the people were wandering around, looking a little dazed. With wild whoops and cheers, Fairy Tail burst back onto the scene just on the outskirts of a newly restored Magnolia and rushed towards their beloved Guildhall. All except for Goku and Urza. Goku grabbed the woman's wrist as she had made to run off with their friends and quickly dragged her deeper into the forest. Urza let out a pain grunt as they walked out of view of the city. Her entire body still ached from her battle and the pain was muddling her mind. No matter how much she might deny it, she was truly feeling her wounds. Goku noticed despite her best efforts. A flare of ki entered her body and traveled throughout her body, dulling her pain just enough to ease her breathing. Sorry, I should have thought about your wounds. I'll try to keep this as brief as I can so you can go get patched up. It's just... Goku's brow furrowed. I learned something about your new powers right before we managed to come back home. Shaking his head, Goku sighed. Urza waited patiently for him to collect himself. The weight it looked like he was carrying on his shoulders, whatever they were about to discuss was heavy on his mind. He had her complete attention, regardless of what it was. After a moment, Goku turned up his head and looked her straight in the eyes. We need to talk about the Titania. Dragon Ball Z Epic Announcer Man Voice Man, Questions Asked, Truths Revealed, and the Fate of Magic in the Balance. Next time in Escalation. Goku and Urza 2. Fairy vs. Fei. Don't miss it. S and D S and D S and D S and D. S and D, and now, I'm here for a pirate adventure. Except that may be a lie, because pirates may or may not actually be involved. S and D S and D S and D S and D. Okay. Levi's mind took quick stock of the situation. She was in a room with, presumably, the captain of the ghost ship. The door was shut and, based on the fact that Jet and Droy hadn't broken it down yet, it was likely magically reinforced. But she couldn't hear the sounds of anyone battering on the walls, so either it was also magically silenced, or Jet and Droy had been incapacitated. Well, they could take care of themselves, better to focus on the situation at hand. There were a couple of ways this could play out, depending on what kind of apparition this ghost was. The key was to figure that out before giving it a chance to decide to kill her. Calm and collected, keep it talking as long as possible. Look for any clues it might reveal, accidentally or otherwise. Still, she kept one hand on her light pen in case she needed to throw up a spell. The ghost hadn't attacked yet, but the trident it was clutching looked remarkably sharp and solid. Would you be the captain of this ship? she asked politely. The fact that the ghost could talk was promising, if he were an insane phantasm that did nothing but scream, she'd have no choice but to fight. But if it could speak, it could be reasoned with, maybe. I? The brim of his hat tipped downward as the spectre nodded. Let me be the first to welcome you aboard. Does the captain have a name? Names were important. Many undead lost all sense of who they once were. Only the sane or recently dead remembered their name, or the exceptionally powerful ones, like an archlich. Hopefully that wasn't what she was dealing with here. Indeed I do, lass. Call me. The ghost's lips twitched slightly. Ishmael. So, he remembered. That was either very promising, or very, very bad. Nice to meet you, Ishmael. 
My name is Levi, and I am a mage of fairy tale. A mage? On my ship? The name of the guild didn't seem to elicit any reaction. Odd. If the man was recently dead, then he should have at least heard of the guild. Everyone knew about fairy tale, even if it was only in the context of, hey, why is there a crater in the middle of town? That wasn't here last week. Now what would bring a mage such as yourself out to sea? Well, are you aware that you're dead? Some ghosts didn't realize. I am. Oh? Well, there are people going missing from the coastal town. People I've seen are on your ship. I? That would be because I've been kidnapping them. Levi blinked. That was less promising. Well, she said slowly, carefully readying her light pen to write the word exorcise. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to return them and to stop kidnapping anymore. Now I'm afraid I can't do that just yet. The ghost answered, his eyes flickering. I still need them. But I have every intention of returning them when I'm done. With what? Saving the sea, the ghost loomed over her, his trident glowing pearly white. And you, lass, are not going to stop me. Levi was tempted to slap an exorcism on his face right there. But that was the fairy in her talking, and she knew there was something she was missing here. He hadn't attacked her yet, so there was still a chance that she could talk this out. Save the sea, she echoed. What's wrong with it? It's been eaten. He answered simply. Um. Mr. Gajil. Wendy whispered. What, he spat back irritably. Wendy flinched back, but didn't take the hint. I'm worried about Juvia, I, um, think there might be something wrong with her. There's always been something wrong with her. He grunted, glancing over at the miniaturized water mage. She was crouching by the edge of the raft, staring silently into the water like she was listening to something. Oi, Juvia, he called. It was a few moments before she glanced his way. Something wrong. Can't you hear it? Juvia demanded. Hear what? It's scared. Juvia answered, turning back to the water. It's afraid and angry, Juvia can hear it calling. Gajil tilted his head to one side. It was possible that Wendy had a point. Juvia might be a frigging weirdo, but she didn't usually hear voices. He glanced around at the dark, rolling waters around them. If Juvia was going to have a psychotic breakdown here, then they were probably boned. Why'd he let himself be dragged out onto the ocean again? He hated the ocean. Maybe he should knock her out. Just a little tap on the noggin before she could see it coming to keep her from drowning them all. He nodded to himself and raised a hand, letting iron scales sprout on it. He'd need to do this in one quick motion before she could react instinctively, it was the only way to actually hit her. Then, without warning, Juvia pitched forward and plopped into the waves, which swallowed her whole without so much as a splash. Shit! Miss Juvia! Wendy cried, making to go after her. Oh no you don't! Carla hissed, pouncing on her and sprouting wings to haul the girl back. Guys? A voice called from above, and Gajil looked up to see Jet leaning over the ship's railings. A panic looked in his eyes. Levi has been trapped in the captain's quarters, Joy and I can't beat our way in. Double shit. Um, Gajil. Wendy's voice was teetering on the edge of full-blown panic making him look around. All around them, the sea had gone still as a mirror, not a wave or ripple in sight. Triple shit. Levi stared at the ghost. Well, that didn't sound insane at all. A peaceful outcome to the situation was becoming less and less promising. We are talking about the ocean, right? The thing we are floating on. It's been eaten. Yes? The ghost nodded. I heard it call out in fear and rage and knew I could sleep no more. All right, and what, exactly, has eaten it? The old man of the sea. 
he seeks to reclaim what was once his. The spectre shook his head. He must be stopped before it is too late. Levi frowned, her mind racing. On the one hand, insane. On the other, if he wasn't talking literally, lots of magical or supernatural creatures tended to wrap up their meanings in flowery words, so there could be some truth in what he was saying. So far, Ishmael hadn't ticked very many of the usual boxes that would point to him being an insane revenant. She also wasn't getting a very evil vibe from him, something she'd gotten very good at after dealing with curses for so long. And if there actually had been some event or entity that had brought Ishmael back from the grave, then exorcising him wouldn't actually solve the problem. What happens if this old man of the sea gets what he wants? The sea will be his to command once more. He was never tolerant of those humans who dared to sail upon his domain. He will resume his war against them. The ghost tilted his head to one side. The world of the living will be washed away. Levi opened her mouth to reply when the ghost jerked backward, he whirled away from her to face the door. What was that, he demanded. What was what? Levi asked, taken aback. She hadn't heard anything. The sea, the ghost roared. The sea is shifting. His body glowed and he dove into the glowing patch of ectoplasm on the floor, vanishing from sight. Levi blinked. Well, that conversation was over. Cautiously she strode over to the door and reached for the handle. It turned without effort and she pushed it open a crack. The door just opened, the fuck did you idiots mean you couldn't get in? Gajil's voice ripped through the quiet of the room and made Levi blink. She pushed the door open the rest of the way and saw Gajil standing behind it his arm morphed into a metal crowbar. Levi. Jet and Droy zipped around Gajil to reach her. You're all right. We couldn't reach you. We've been trying to get the inside, but nothing we tried was working. Because you two are weak as shit. Gajil huffed. I just had to touch it and it opened right up. Miss Levi. Wendy stepped forward, clutching. A bag in her hands nervously, the baby phoenix was poking its head out of the bag, looking around curiously at all the noise. Something is wrong with Juvia. Wendy went on. She jumped into the ocean and now something strange is happening. A lot of people were talking at her at once, but she zeroed in on the last thing. What? All hands on deck, a voice roared from above her. Ready the harpoons. The old man approaches. She looked up and saw Ishmael standing on the crow's nest of the ship, waving his trident at something off the starboard bow. That the ghost captain? Gajil asked, cracking his knuckles. If we beat him up, we can leave right. No, don't. Levi grabbed his arm before he could step forward. I think something else is happening. Let's get to the railing. She hurried away, the other fairies trailing after her. Around them the people that Ishmael had kidnapped had snapped themselves into motion. Hauling up ropes and harpoons and loading them into the guns mounted all along the ship. When they reached the railing, Levi paused and gaped. The sea had gone still, all the way to the horizon the water was a flat dark mirror. I think Juvia is doing this, Gajil grunted. Fuck if I know why. I suspect we are about to find out. Levi said, pointing. The night was well lit by the light of the full moon, and although the water was still dark, she could make out a dark patch in the water off the ship. A patch that was getting bigger and shifting, the only sign of movement on the ocean. It looks like something is getting hauled up. Jet commented. Something, ah. Uh. Droy swallowed. Something huge. The shape was thrashing as it grew. It easily dwarfed the ship. Droy, Levi said. Start growing plants. Big ones. Gajil, see if you can find some harpoons to feed on. Wendy, ah. Uh, I'll start eating the sky. She supplied helpfully. That's a really awkward way to phrase it. But good. Do that. 
The shape was approaching the surface, it looked nothing so much as a mass of claws and tentacles. The still water broke some distance from the ship, two red pillars with black bands were rising out of the water, they were as thick as trees and curved into points, they twitched back and forth wildly as the weird shape continued to rise. They look like lobster antennae, Jet murmured. And then something bigger broke the surface. It was a face, blue-green and chitinous, covered in spikes and covered in a multitude of black protruding eyes. I think I'm gonna be sick. Jet muttered, sounding queasy. Oh, for the love of fuck. Gajil grumbled, rejoining them and spitting out fleck of harpoon as he chewed. Please tell me that's not Juvia standing on its head. Levi squinted, there was something halfway between the antennae. A tiny figure with blue hair, and her hands upstretched. Sorry, I'm afraid so. She said, glancing down at the water. There was movement, not just from the leviathan's thrashing, but water was surging towards it, buoying it upward. I think she's what's dragging it to the surface. You know, Jet said, a manic tone setting into his words. Most kids bring back a stray cat, or a little doggy. Well, she's not keeping it. Gajil hissed. Oi, fancy feet. He gave Jet a shove. Run over there and grab her. Excuse me. Jet whirled. You can run over water, right? I can, Jet said. But if you think I'm going anywhere near that thing. He pointed at the creature, more of its body was visible now. The hard shell covering its face giving way to iridescent scales with flashing yellow lines running down its body. It also appeared to have tons of rubbery tentacles, each one ending in an enormous lobster claw that looked like they could split the boat in half. We are going to have to fight it, aren't we? Droy whispered at Levi. Um. She hesitated. Fire. Ishmael's voice roared. There was a series of thunks, and half a dozen harpoons went whistling towards the creature's face, plunging into its eyes and sticking fast. The deep-sea horror lurched backward, an enormous hole gapping open below the eyes, lined with thousands of jagged spikes, and gave off a watery roar that seemed to bubble through their minds. Yes, Droy. Levi sighed, raising her quill. I think the answer to that question is yes. Goku and Urza too, Fairy vs. Fae. For the members of Fairy Tale, who had been trapped inside of the Edo Las Lacrima, it was as if no time had passed between Goku's warning and their return. For the entirety of their captivity, they might as well have been asleep. When they awoke, a number of their friends were just gone. Lucy. Kana murmured, twisting around the room in slow bewilderment. A brief moment of panic spread throughout the building and suddenly everyone was on their feet and getting ready to charge out of the building. Their panic only grew worse when they looked outside and saw a completely different sky than what had just been over their heads moments before. It was impossible to tell just how much time had passed, but for the sun to be so high in the sky again, at the very least whatever took their comrades had a day's lead on them. Before Fairy Tail managed to mobilize though, the doors burst open. Kana, who had been all of five seconds from blasting through the exit herself, suddenly found herself with an armful of extremely happy blonde. The perpetual drunk just barely managed to keep her feet under her at the surprise impact, but she just barely managed it. Urgent panic dulled to bewildered befuddlement, and a knot of tension eased from her back. It was quickly replaced with the feeling of all of the air being completely squeezed out of her lungs and her spine starting to pop, but at least there was progress. So, ah, Lou. Mind filling me in on what just happened. Or maybe easing up just a bit. I'm sure everyone else has a whole lot of questions. Kana glanced behind her to see if there was any help coming, but all of the faces in the room were aimed towards the door and filled with slack-jawed surprise. Um. Lee's Anna blinked at the number of people staring wide-eyed at her and carefully reached down to grab her sister's arm. Hi. She squeaked. Long time no see. 
As Lee's Anna squirmed under the sudden attention, Mira Jane's own eyes were darting around the room. She found who she was looking for, took in the glistening eyes, the blubbering lip, and the shaking legs, and promptly grabbed onto her sister as well and subtly shifted herself to brace for impact. Lee's Anna. Elfman roared from the back of the room. Half a dozen mags went flying across the room as the giant barreled his way to the door, completely ignoring everyone he trampled over on his mad dash to his sisters. Behind the two girls, Natsu and Grey wisely stepped out from directly behind the pair right before the Strauss siblings collided. Laughter and shrieks filled the air as the two girls spun around through the air and landed on top of Elfman's giant chest in a massive hug. The youngest sibling helplessly started giggling and wrapped her arms around her elders to the best of her ability. Myra Jane reached out as well, and at long last, the family finally felt whole. Grey and Natsu quietly stepped around the pile on the ground and into the guild hall to begin filling in their friends what had happened in the other world, but none of the three even noticed. After all that happened, after being separated for so long, all they could feel now was a quiet, content bliss that rolled through their very souls. They lay together for a long while, simply happy to bask in one another's presences. Eventually though, Lee's Anna couldn't help but to break the quiet. With a happy grin, she reached up and gave her brother's bicep a squeeze. So, when did this happen bro? Last I remember seeing you, you still hadn't even gotten rid of all the baby fat yet. Lee's Anna teased. Elfman's grin turned sly, and with a quick heave he was up on his feet, and had balanced his sisters so that each on was sitting atop one of his biceps as flexed. Ah! As a man, I have dedicated myself to improving my body to its absolute limit. That way, I will be able to protect you no matter what. The teen boasted. Perhaps later his mind would drift back to what had happened when she had disappeared in the first place, and perhaps later, he would have to confront the last remnants head-on. But now, with Lysanna's face practically glowing with laughter, the idea couldn't even enter his mind. So, Myra Jane said from her perch, Should we head home? We have a lot of catching up to do, and I'm sure that the rest of the guild wouldn't mind waiting their turn for us. Elfman and Lee's Anna both twitched at the sudden reminder that they were in public. A light dusting of pink spread across Elfman's face while Lee's Anna laughed heartily and waved to the crowd. Yeah, I think we can get out of here. She said cheerfully. Just one thing first. Has anyone else staked a claim while I was gone? Lee's Anna asked her sister pointedly. Elfman scrunched up his brow in confusion, but Myra Jane smirked. Unless something happened in the last half a day that I somehow completely missed, you should be all in the clear. Lee's Anna nodded gratefully and hopped down from her perch. In between steps, her features became more feline as she marched across the room. Natsu didn't see her coming until her arms were around his neck. Hey, hey. What are you doing Lee's Anna? The teen hopped back with a fierce blush on his face. Oh just marking my scent and laying a claim. She said sweetly, letting everyone know that I'm back and that they can't move in anymore. Otherwise, they'll have to answer to her. Lee's Anna said, pointing at Myra Jane. Oh my. You don't want to fight for your claim, Lee's Anna. Come on, sis. I haven't been able to use my magic in years. Just until I'm back in shape. Myra Jane rolled her eyes, but Lizanna caught the way her sister's lips twitched upwards. You're the best, sis. The animal girl cheered as her features dropped back down to a more humanoid appearance, and she began to skip back towards her family. What wait? Natsu called after her, his hands rising to his neck. What are you trying to claim? His brow furrowed. Is it my scarf? He asked, clutching the cloth protectively. If it is, you can't have it. It's mine, unless I die, in which case Happy has dibs, so you'll have to fight him for it. Oh Natsu, my poor sweet fire baby. Lee's Anna smiled. It's nice to see you haven't changed. 
But no, not you scarf. I'm sure you can figure it out. Otherwise, go find Gramps and tell them that Lee's Anna said that you need to have the talk. Bye everyone, see you later. Just as quickly as they had arrived, the Strauss siblings made their way out of the guild hall towards home. For the first time in years, the third setting the elder siblings always set could finally be used once again. With emotions flying high throughout the guild hall, Goku's and Urza's absence meant unnoticed. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Please? Course. Get in there and give her a piece of your mind for me too, yeah. With a smile at his earnest grin, Urza closed her eyes and allowed the connection to drag her away. They stood in the middle of an alien forest. Orange trees with bright pink leaves surrounded them on all sides, the sky was green with blue clouds, and a sun that shined bright like a silver diamond hung high in the air. The air itself painted everything in a pale blue light, muting some of the bizarre colors and warping others. Urza's own clothing were different as well, her armor was gone in place of the tunic that appeared around her when she took on her own fey power. All of the metal that she normally wore had vanished, everything from the sword on her waist to the strap of her belt. But if Urza was different, then that was nothing compared to how the Titania appeared. The Fey woman's appearance had completely changed compared to their last meeting. Her hair was now in a silvery braid that trailed down past her waist, and her eyes had turned into a harsh electric blue. Her face looked like porcelain, with blue speckles trailing down straight from beneath her eyes and down her face onto her neck. Her clothing looked like finely intertwined vines, wrapping around her entire body down from the base of her neck down to her feet. The being noticed Urza's confused gaze and shrugged carelessly. The Fey are chaotic by nature, child. Things like appearance are hardly static for those such as us. We shift as we please and adapt as we see fit. We are beings of nature, change is entwined into our very existence. What else is tied into the existence of the Fey? Urza asked. You know what I was just told, correct? The claims from the other version of me. Of course. I may not monitor everything that you do, but any time you tap into my power, or your emotions spike, I am your witness. That boy's technique was an intriguing one, most people with the ability to connect with minds are either telepathic or magical in origin. This was the first time that I have come across someone using KI to produce that effect. Most impressive indeed. I did not come here to discuss his abilities. Urza said icily. You know exactly what I want to know from you. I suppose that I do. Very well then. On a surface level, what the girl spoke of was accurate, however she is simply too ignorant of the full scope of the Fae to see us, as more than shady villains, laughing manically from our home world, as her own loses power. Then what is happening? Urza demanded. Do you know where the Fae come from Urza? The woman asked instead. Fae are not born like any normal species. They cannot reproduce. Instead, the first Fae selected beings that intrigued her, and offer them a chance to evolve. Those that she selected followed suit, and gradually built up a world of pure magic, one beyond the comprehension of the world you reside in. The heroine that saved Idolas from that long-forgotten threat. The one accused of selling out her planet. The face spread her porcelain arms. She stands before you. Then the world that you are slowly killing is your own. Urza's eyes narrowed, her hand reaching instinctively for a sword hilt that was not there. Yes, the face head nodded and the smirk became something more solemn. Though the choice was not my own. I was merely offered the same thing that you were, great power in exchange for the ability to save my home. For you, this demon Piccolo will bring about a cataclysm just as great as the one that I was forced to confront while I still had my humanity. Like you, when I was confronted with the destruction of my home, I was given a choice. Surrender my humanity in its entirety, embrace the full power of the Fae, and save my world from certain destruction, or try fruitlessly to battle against a threat beyond anything your planet can confront and die alongside everyone and everything. My guild will die horribly. I know the level of opponent you are about to face, as well as the level of power your world can produce. There are threats roaming around your own world that are far beyond anything you can confront right now, 
beings that could crush you like so many ants should they choose to acknowledge your existence. These same threats, when they confront Piccolo, will fall. The simple fact is, nothing on your world can compete with the raw power of the world that the demon comes from. The face shook her head and laughed, a sad and wild titter that bounced off the misshapen trees. It is like a sleepy little moon thinking to outshine the sun it reflects. No, your world as it is now is doomed. But should you become a fey, you will gain access to the sum of all magic from your world. You shall become a demigod walking amongst mortals, and in doing so you will gain the strength to prevent your extinction. Those are the choices given to you, no more, and no less. With every word the face spoke, Urza's expression grew colder. My guild won't fall. She ground out. I don't care how powerful this demon is. We will go after him with everything we have. If we need someone from another world, then Goku already fits that role. If all you are offering me is a ruined world in exchange for a supposed chance at victory, then I will instead side with my family. You misunderstand, the Fae shook her head. I do not want you to fall. If I thought that your guild could handle the coming threat without having to turn you into a Fae, I would have never even tried to contact you. I do not particularly wish for your world to go through what mine did. But more importantly, I do not want you to have to go through what I did, the creature's eyes turned upward, taking on a samba look to them. I was like you, Urza. I was proud and certain in my power. It was only once I watched as everyone I cared for during my time, as a human crushed and slaughtered that I learned the truth of my weakness. Urza blinked, her anger mixing with uncertainty, as she listened to the Fae's words. It was only then that I gave in to the power and extracted my vengeance. Had I accepted it sooner, those I cared for would not have had to die in such a way. You do not have to go through that, for you have the power now. If you accept it, and truly make it your own, you will be able to stop Piccolo the instant he makes himself known and save your world in a matter of moments. None of those you care for will have to fall. The gradual loss of magic will be harsh, but it is not swift. Most of those you love will be long gone before they see any of the truly adverse effects. All things die one day, but they will still be able to live long, happy lives. Wouldn't you prefer that to dying violently in their prime? Urza's face was set hard, clamping down on the emotions wearing around within her mind. What of you then? If this enemy is truly so powerful that only a fae such as yourself could hope to win, why force me through this transformation? Why not confront the demon yourself and end the threat before it can harm any innocent? The Titania's face twisted into a scowl. There are rules that I am required to follow, Urza. Rules set in place by the first of our kind, she said icily. I am just over two centuries old, barely considered prepubescent amongst my kind. There are elder fae with far more power than I could hope to contend with, and they too are bound by these rules. Our kind cannot interfere with worlds without a stable connection to the fae realm. And such a connection can only be established through the will of one who dwells there. You, in this case. The creature crossed her arms. The only way I would be allowed to aid you here more so than just establishing a basic connection would be for you to completely transform into a fae and then invite me to help you in the defense of your world. If you wish to save your world and those you care for from total annihilation, becoming like me is still your best and only option. You are being genuine. Urza said after a long moment. You believe everything that you are saying. You truly think that my world will fall unless I accept your power. Can you offer another option? Your guild isn't strong enough. The rest of the guilds aren't. The strongest on your world aren't. How will you stop what is coming? If you don't want to be a fae, then answer me. What will you do? If my strength is not enough now, then I will get stronger. I shall train myself into the ground and surpass him with my own power. Not enough time. The Fae answered simply. 
Unless you have some rituals or magics that can boost your strength a hundredfold, it would take decades of training to reach his strength at the rate of improvement that can be expected from your world. What will you do? I'll find something capable of sealing him away. That was how his old world dealt away with him, correct? The Titania's reproachful look dropped and turned contemplative. A possibility. She answered, her head tilting to one side. But not reliable. Piccolo is well aware of the dangers of sealing and similar magics now, and he will not be invading your world alone. He has been trapped inside of the dead zone for a decade, and has been capable of making more children the entire time he has been trapped there. Flute was only one of them. In turn, each of them is capable of reproducing as well, and all of these demons will be working to protect Piccolo. Even if you should find magic capable of sealing him away, the rest of his kin would still wreak havoc on your world. So, again I ask. What. Will. You. Do. I don't know. I don't know how to battle this threat. I barely even understand what it is, let alone how to fight it. But I can't surrender my world's magic. Even if the price will not affect me or my friends, it would still fall on our children, on our grandchildren. I can't believe that the situation is as hopeless as you describe. We will get stronger, all of us. When the time comes, my guild, as well as all of the others around the world will face the threat together and prevail. Urza closed her eyes, drawing in a deep breath to calm herself. I appreciate the gravity of what you have told me, she said slowly. And I do not begrudge you from making that decision when it was forced upon you, but I cannot do the same. I ask you, please severe our connection and allow me to challenge this threat on my own terms. For a long moment, the Titania was quiet. She just stared into Urza's eyes, her expression closed off beyond the knight's ability to read. After a while, she sighed and closed her long-fingered hands into fists. I see. I suppose it was unreasonable of me to expect you to fully understand things that are beyond you when they are only discussed in the abstract. Flute is still your only real experience with creatures like what is coming, and while it was powerful, it was still well within your ability to understand and defeat. If I want you to make a fully informed decision, I need to demonstrate just what is coming. A nebula of power exploded off of the Titania, knocking Urza from her feet and sending her tumbling end over end across the ground. Urza came to a stop and gasped, feeling the weight of raw magic and power pressing her into the ground. She forced her arms beneath her and shoved herself to her knees, then to her feet as she jerked her head up to stare at the Fae. Her appearance didn't change in the slightest, but her composure completely changed. The dignified feel that she had been putting off, the feeling of one dedicated to the role of a diplomat had fallen away, revealing a blooded warrior underneath the mask. The aura dancing around her lit up the illusionary forest like it was consuming the land in wildfire. In the middle of the raging storm, the Titania stood completely still, unmoved by the chaos her aura was causing around her. This power, this is the level of what I was forced to face my own calamity with, at the very beginning of my transformation. While Piccolo has been beyond our ability to observe since he was sealed away, I can tell you that he likely would have defeated me in terms of raw strength had I fought him like this. His skill, unfortunately, I have no way of judging. However, this should be more than enough to demonstrate to you just how hopeless the battle you are dooming your world to would be. Come. Strike me with everything in your arsenal, besides the power that I have granted to you. All your armors, your swords, and your tricks. I will brush them all aside like flies, and then you shall understand. Once you see how helpless you are, you will accept my power without complaint. As much as you may dislike it, you will let me help you save your world. The Fae demanded, her eyes hard. Urza met her gaze and gave an ultimatum of her own. Very well. However, should I prove to impress you with my own strength, then you shall stand aside, let the bond between us fall, 
and let my guild rise to the challenge on our own. She declared proudly. The Titania scoffed in response. Once more you misunderstand. This is not a test. I was not challenging you. I was simply making a statement. The end of her sentence was punctuated by a solid ball of magic shooting out and slamming into Urza's face. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
she snapped her fingers and called down a bolt of lightning. Urza howled as the electricity roared through her body, only just barely managing to stay conscious. Do you understand yet? Can we end this farce? Another snap, and the ground beneath Urza exploded in a plume of molten earth. Pure instincts in the flame empress armor kept Urza on her feet, but before she could do anything yet another pulse of magic turned her armor to dust. Your magic is too tied to your tools. There is nothing that you can utilize once you are without them. The Titania said, as she walked to stand over the staggered warrior. Urza roared in defiance and swung a fist with all her force. The blow connected, but the Fey didn't even blink. Your tenacity at least, is quite impressive. The Fey noted. As easily reached up, grabbed onto Urza's wrist and began to twist. That you continue to stand and look me in the eye speaks well of your character. But pride will not save you from destruction. Only once you take the power to back up that attitude, you shall be quite the force to be reckoned with. Urza gasped in pain as the bones in her wrist started to strain and collapsed to her knees. The Titania continued to idly apply pressure, barely paying attention to what she was doing. I take no pleasure in doing this to you. Understand that you made it necessary. To that end, is there anything else that you would like to try? Or have you had enough? Urza's breath started to come out in sharp gasps as the Fey applied more and more pressure, and her bone threatened to snap. After a few moments, the Titania lessened the pressure just enough to give Urza a bit of relief, but nowhere close to enough for her to maneuver in any meaningful way. You should stop now, Urza. The damage you are taking in here is being reflected onto your actual body to a lesser degree. I don't want to hurt you any more than absolutely necessary. We should, oh. The Fey's voice trailed off as the world around them began to shudder in and out of focus. Oh? Are you trying to change our location to somewhere you feel you have more of an advantage? She asked curiously. I wouldn't have expected you to have the focus to pull something off like this with where you stand right now. Slowly, the pressure began to worsen once more. Gah? Ah? Uh, not me. Not me. Urza cried as her nerves screamed out within her arm. The instant the denial left her lips, the Fey dropped her to the ground, tilting her head curiously. We are in a mental link, Urza. It's just the two of us here. The old area had faded away completely now, and new and new environment began to fade in. Tall, narrow mountains covered in grass surrounded them on all sides. Small bamboo patches poked out of the ground in random intervals dotting the landscape. More importantly though, just a few feet away from where they stood was a little red and white hut that Urza had become quite familiar with. I see. So, is this where you grew up then? Urza asked softly. The Fey's face. Scrunched up in question, only to notice that the words had not been directed at her, but behind her. She turned to a glowing blue fist to the face. The KI-empowered punch detonated on impact, knocking her backwards a handful of steps before she could regain her balance. When the spots cleared from her eyes, it was to the sight of Goku standing tall within the imagined recreation of the first place he called home. Yeah, this is Mount Paozu. It's been a really long time since I've seen this place. Goku said happily. It's nice to have a chance to visit, even if it's just for something like this. The Titania's head turned to the side slightly, as she regarded the fighter's sudden appearance. You aren't a mental construct or a memory. She said frowning. You are the real son Goku. Tell me, how did you manage to connect yourself to this minscape and join the battle? Well, this kind of felt like an image training spa, so I just did that. Took me a while to figure out where I needed to go in here, but I'm pretty satisfied with the results. Image training. I can't say I've heard of that technique. At some point, I'd be very interested in picking your brain to see just what types of KI techniques you have developed. Humming to herself, 
the Fey turned back towards Urza. One thing you might wish to know is that Ki will be completely unaffected by the drain of your ascension. Goku will be unchanged, and if he has even the slightest bit of skill as an instructor, he opens the opportunity for your world to turn more towards those types of powers rather than magical ones. Does that change your opinion on the situation at all? No. Urza said promptly. And neither does the condition of my body. I will stand through this regardless. Goku, I shall properly explain things to you later, but for now please help me show the Titania the power of our guild. Goku nodded mildly and turned to look the Titania over. The energy that she was putting off now, even just standing around out of combat was staggering. Even as his mind was racing through ways to combat her, his instincts began screaming out all on their own. In this mental world that he had thrown himself into, the subconscious ruled. Through that ruling, the sun began to set at an incredible speed. The sun rocketed down behind the horizon, and the air began to darken, as what clouds there were began to pull away to revel a full moon. B.A. Bump. B.A. Bump. Ho! A gleam of genuine excitement flashed in the Titania's eyes, as she beheld the Uzuru before her eyes slid back over towards Urza. That single moment of distraction was just enough time for Goku's gigantic form to slam an oversized fist into her body. The Fae grunted in annoyance, as she was launched skywards and straight through one of the mountains dotting the horizon. She landed hard with her back on the rocks and carefully weighed her odds. How long had it been since she'd had a chance to fight something interesting? A long-buried part of her longed to return and face this challenge. But, she was not here for enjoyment. Urza was the priority. As the dust began to settle, Uzuru began to charge Ki in his mouth. Before he could even reach half power though, the face struck first. A sphere of power flew off in the sky, quickly vanishing from view amongst the stars decorating the night. A second later, the moon fell apart. The magic projectile fragmented the moon into hundreds of pieces, leaving a cloud of debris where the sphere had once been. The great monkey froze, its eyes staring up at the hole in the sky as it began to shrink. Goku's wits returned just in time to see the Titania materialize in front of him. The Fei uncurled her fingers and a sphere of solid magic blasted into Goku's throat. The martial artist collapsed to his knees even as Urza charging back in, swinging desperately with a glowing katana. The weapon easily broke on the Fei's skin, and in the moment of surprise Urza experienced she had a fist buried into her gut and was thrown on top of the Goku's slowly recovering form. If you held hope that form could save your world, abandon it. The trigger is obvious and Piccolo will blow your moon out of the sky just as easily as I did. Once again, your own power here lacks what is necessary to save the world. That's not true. Urza gasped out from her place on the ground. If he can fight at that level, even if it is just with the Uzuru, then that means it is possible for us to reach that power. Just the fact that it exists means that we can reach it. Our world can be saved without your power Titania. No matter how much you tell me otherwise, I won't change my mind. The face stared down at the two fallen fighters glaring up at her. There was no yield in their eyes, not even from Goku, who still wasn't even aware of the reason behind their fight. The Titania sighed. I said before, I don't want to force you. I can't force you. She scoffed. If you are really this stubborn, and you don't care how many people you are dooming, I can't stop you. So then, we have an impasse. You are too stubborn to live, yet I am too invested to allow you to die. The Titania looked down at her feet and sighed. If you are that determined to stick to your folly, then I shall see my connection to you stilled. I will not remove it but you will not be able to access it either unless you open it fully and initiate the transformation. At the very least, I can hope that you will chose to accept my help when everything around you beings to crumple. When your friends are dead and dying, and your guild is left in ruins, call me. You can tell me to close the door, 
but I won't burn the bridge. Ask for the power, and even if the drain can't be performed quickly enough, I'll fuel your victory with my own power. Around the three figures, the mental world began to waver and fall away. Son Goku. That dragon ball that you carry. I know that you won't destroy it, so guard it with your life. As long as you have it, Piccolo will come for you. He will know that the balls exist on this world the moment he arrives here, and he will hunt for them to the ends of the earth. As the world faded to black, Goku and Urza heard one final line. I really do hope that you two manage to survive this somehow. I really think that, had we met before I became what I am today, we would have been great friends. Goku and Urza found themselves back in the forest, even more bloody than they had been when they had first arrived. The two sat side by side in silence for a few minutes before Urza turned to face Goku and raised an eyebrow. Did he want to know the whole story? Goku shrugged and held out a hand. No, not particularly. Urza grasped Goku's hand and the two managed to pull themselves back up onto their feet. The pair slipped their arms around one another's shoulders, bracing each other and steadying their feet. Cake for lunch. Goku asked as the two started to make their way back towards the guild. Urza nodded tiredly. Strawberry. S and D S and D S and D S and D. Levi stared at the enormous thing that towered over the ghost ship. It was like all those old fisherman stories of krakens and sea serpents rolled into one giant mountain of fish scales and lobster claws. She was also keenly aware of just how ill-equipped they were to fight such a thing. Team Shadow Gear didn't really do giant monsters. Where was Natsu when you needed him? Well, no. Not Natsu, because they were on a boat. But where was Grey? Or Urza? Or Goku? They would be great at fighting on the ocean. Levi shook her head. Those weren't helpful thoughts. She needed to focus on who she did have. She had two dragon slayers, although she was pretty sure Gajil couldn't swim and Wendy, Actually she wasn't totally sure what Wendy could do. Oh? She had Juvia. Who had, brought the monster to the surface. Hopefully she had a good reason for that. Levi squinted, she could barely make of out the miniaturized mage sitting astride the creature's head. Juvia was throwing her hands around wildly and geysers of water were spouting from the still water of the ocean and twisting towards the monster, so it looked like she was attacking the monster. But something was wrong. Levi had personally seen Juvia slice through steel with a handful of water, but the giant geysers just splashed harmlessly against the creature's hide, as though Juvia was releasing the spell at the last second. The creature lunged forward, a wall of flesh and reeking fish and Levi was pretty sure it was going to crush them all right there and then. Forward, she heard Ishmael scream and she was thrown backward off her feet as the ship zipped forward as though something beneath the water was pushing it along. The leviathan crashed into nothing but empty water. What? Levi blinked from her place on the deck, her mind momentarily thrown from the situation. But ships with sails can't. She shook her head. Right, it's a ghost ship. She shook her head and scrambled to her feet. Now was not the time for thinking. Ishmael might be dead, but all the people he had abducted weren't. They needed to protect them. Droy, she shouted, pulling out her light pen, she was really missing her phoenix feather cool right now. A stick of plastic and metal just didn't gave the same sense of comfort compared to the feather of a mystical firebird that could summon waves of fire. How are those plants coming? All set, he answered, throwing a last few handfuls of seeds overboard. Give me some light. Solid script. Levi shouted, as the sea monster's head poked out of the waves and loomed over them. Sunlight. Her pen flashed and the word shot into monster's face and exploded as its definition took effect. The monster shrieked, 
the eyes that weren't harpooned rolling ferociously as a white film spread over them. Plant magic. Joy screamed, thrusting his hands out, kelp enwalled. The surface of the sea frothed and turned green, as hundreds of slimy-looking tendrils of seaweed burst to life. They flowed over the monstrous creature, wrapping around claws, spikes and fins, tying together whatever they could. Blinded, and under the sudden entrapment, the creature floundered in the water, flopping down heavily before it could slam onto them. Levi was under no illusions that the plants would hold it for long, but that's not what they needed. Gajil. She shouted. Do the dragon slayer thing. Gajil pulled a half-eaten harpoon away from his mouth and threw back his head. Iron dragons roar. A whirlwind of shrapnel shot through the air, shredding claws, seaweed and tentacles to ribbons, as it slammed into the creature's side. It lurched backward with a hiss like a fizzling mountain. Levi gave a worried frown. That had been a powerful attack, but the creature was just so massive, Gajil might as well have been going at a rhino with a pocket knife. Half a dozen fresh tentacles rose out of the water, unhindered by plants or iron and slammed down between it and the ship, sending up an enormous wave of water that threatened to swamp them. Lever's hand shot up, but her mind blanked, she couldn't think of a word that would stop the wave, if the ship capsized, that thing would devour them all. Then a stream of water shot out from the wave, racing ahead and splashing onto the deck before her. The water swirled and reformed into Juvia, who threw up her hands and the wave froze, then reversed direction, surging back into the monster's face. Have I mentioned how glad Juvia is our friend? Jet asked, clinging to the ship's railing and looking sick. Nothing Juvia is doing is working. Juvia shrieked, stomping her foot on the deck. Why is it not dying when Juvia kills it? Because it has eaten the sea. Ishmael said, rising out of the deck beside them, making Juvia whirl around. Ishmael. Levi demanded, what is this thing? I told you. It is the old man of the sea. The ghost answered. Oceanus the Titan. Lord of the deep waves, risen from the depths to reclaim what was once his. He waved a hand over the stilled waters. How can the ocean possibly hurt him, when he has eaten its heart? You keep saying that. Levi said hurriedly, the monster was busy at the moment, blinding ripping at the countless strands of seaweed entrapping it. What exactly do you mean by it ate the ocean? What specifically happened? It devoured Lavaille's vessel, and with it, her power. Why did the dead always have to be so cryptically unhelpful? What does that, Levi paused. Lavaille, she'd heard that name recently. Hadn't the mayor mentioned something about it? The old sea goddess. Do you mean it ate her shrine? More than that. Pearly lines of silver were running down the ghost's cheeks, as he glared at the flailing monster. She slept within the statue. Now she is trapped within it, and the sea itself mourns her loss. The spectral farce twisted into a rictus of rage. From my watery grave I heard its lament and clawed my way back to the surface. I will see it freed. He spun away. First mate, he roared. Are the bomb harpoons ready? A bulky person with a pair of binoculars and a tourist hat saluted. Then take aim and fire. You can hardly miss. I shall man the forward cannon. The ghost shrunk into the floor. So. Gajil grunted, stomping over to them. That guy is insane. How the fuck can an ocean be sad? It's just a bunch of water. So are we, for the most part. Levi answered, turning to stare at the monstrosity in the waves. It had nearly torn all the seaweed from its body, and no doubt would start focusing on crushing them very soon. She wasn't sure if she believed the story about an ancient goddess, but something unnatural was definitely happening. He's telling the truth. Juvia declared, stomping her foot. When Juvia touched the ocean, she heard it calling for help. Levi blinked, now that she thought about it, Juvia had started acting strange, 
when she dove into the ocean to look for clues about the missing shrine. The cries for help are coming from that thing. Juvia went on, jabbing a finger at the creature. That is how Juvia found it. She has tried to drown and boil it, but Juvia's magic is not working when she tries to hurt it. So so, she dragged it to the surface in the hope that you all could assist her. The miniaturized water mage turned towards them and Levi realized she was crying. Juvia can still hear the ocean. Juvia wants to help it, but doesn't know what to do. She wailed. Levi looked at the creature, the film over its eyes was fading, the stalks swiveling around in their direction. It began to move towards them, like an iceberg set to crash down on them. There was a percussion of booms and another volley of harpoons shot out towards the creature. Several tentacles shot upwards, shielding the creature's eyes. The harpoons either stuck in the rubbery flesh or bounced. Off the chitinous shell. Then the harpoons exploded, making the monster lurch backward, although Levi was pretty sure it was more in surprise than pain. Levi. Jet said, pulling her out of her thoughts. What's the plan? She blinked e everyone was looking at her, even Gajil. Right, she was the leader. Time to step up. She took a deep breath. All right. Let's assume the story Ishmael told us is true. If the statue at eight is making it more powerful, then we should probably try to get it out. So what? Gajil demanded. We hit it in the gut and hope it hacks it up, the dragon slayer snorted. I can't even tell where the thing's stomach is. Where am I supposed to hit it? Juvia knows what to do, the mage was bouncing on the balls of her feet. It will be in the beast's stomach, if she goes down its throat, she should be able to find it. X fucking cues me. Gajil whirled on her. You are not feeding yourself to that thing. Oh yes Juvia is, she shot back, stamping her foot like a twelve-year-old throwing a tantrum. She has to. You can't hear the ocean calling for help, Juvia can. She bit her lip. The sea has always been a friend to Juvia, even when she didn't have anyone else. Juvia wants to help it. She shook her head. Juvia is indestructible, she can do this. All right, fine. Levi said. Then let's do it. While you're doing that, it's up to the rest of us to keep it occupied. Juvia hesitated. Will the rest of you be all right without Juvia here to protect you? Of course we will. Levi grinned. We're fairies, planning to be a distraction. I almost feel sorry for it. All right. The water mage nodded, grinning back. Juvia is off, then. Her body melted into a stream of water and shot overboard. Levi nodded and turned to the rest. All right, team, our job is to keep it distracted. Time to do what fairies do best. Her team grinned at her, even Gajil was smirking. What's the plan, boss? Jet asked. Levi held up her pen and wrote the word papercut in large letters, then added the word handle in much smaller print next to it. Jet, take this. Run over there and start smacking its eyes. Levi, Jet laughed, grabbing the word handle and turning towards the railing. You are diabolical. His legs glowed and he vanished in a blur. Levi turned away. Droy. Got more seeds. Only land plants, boss. That's fine. Do what you can. On it. Levi felt something tugging on her shirt and turned. Wendy was standing behind her, Carla floating behind, her looking for all the world like she wanted to grab the girl and fly far away from here. Miss Levi, Wendy said. I'm full and ready to go. All right. Levi paused. Um, what can your powers actually do? I can do a dragon's roar. But, the girl shuffled her feet. I saw Gajil do that so I'm not sure that will be very helpful. Most of my magic is support or healing. Right, white mage. Levi nodded. 
Could you buff Gajil's attacks? Um. Wendy nodded. All right, do that. Gajil? Yeah? You're a dragon slayer. Pretend that thing is a dragon and do what comes naturally, also, try not to hit Jet. She added. Fine. He grumbled, turning to Wendy. Come on, brat, show me what you can do. Watch your tongue when you speak to Wendy. Carla hissed. Gajil looked at her, completely unimpressed. The creature was swimming towards them, again. Countless tentacles were rising from the sea like a forest growing from nowhere. How many of those did the stupid thing have? Levi hurried to the stern, her mind flicking through any spells that could be useful. She could try to slap the word slow or stop on it, but she wasn't sure how effective it would be on something that big. Then Levi saw Ishmael already standing at the ship's stern. The ghost raised one hand to his mouth and pointed his glowing trident at the sea monster. He let out a piercing whistle. For a moment nothing happened, then the ocean surged upwards as something burst from the water. An enormous white shape crashed into the creature, knocking it backward. Levi blinked, it was an enormous whale, its skin white as snow and marked with countless scars. The whale thrashed, sinking its teeth into a mass of tentacles and viciously ripping them off. The monster recoiled, the whale was only about a third its size, but it was thrashing so wildly that the monster's tentacles seemed to be having trouble finding purchase. She could also see a make out a brown blur zipping around the monster's face, Jet was having fun. Then the kraken threw back its head and roared. The smoothed surface of the ocean roiled, and a geyser of water erupted into the air and curved, slamming into the whale's head with a meaty slap. The whale jerked, stunned by the blow, and countless tentacles grabbed the whale and threw it off. It surged towards them its more opening wide enough to swallow the ship whole. Out of the corner of her eye, Levi saw Gajil step forward. Wendy was behind him, her cheeks puffed up. As she breathed out whirls of white energy that flowed over the Iron Dragon Slayer. Gajil cracked his neck and raised one hand, a bar of silver metal formed in it, elongating and splitting into three points. Gajil smirked at the mountain of teeth and claws bearing down at them and pulled his arm back. Iron Dragon's trident, he screamed, throwing the weapon. Levi felt a rush of air across her face as the trident shot past, and she was pretty sure she felt the deck jerk backward slightly under her feet. The trident whistled into the open moor and slammed into the back of its throat. The creature's roar cut off and it tumbled backward, its body half lifting out of the water from the force of the blow. Damn! Gajil declared, flexing his fingers as white wisps of smoke drifted off them. He glanced back at Wendy. Not bad, brat. Not bad. Wendy smiled uncertainly. But, as Levi watched, the monster reared upright again. You've got to be fucking with me. Gajil groaned, he raised his hand and another trident formed in it. Wendy, give me another hit. Wait. Levi said, holding up a hand. The monster was convulsing, whipping its head back and forth. Then a geyser of water vomited out of its mouth and shot toward the ship. The water crashed down on the ship, drenching everything and reeking of rotten fish. Levi gagged staggering back under the weight of the stench, and then she heard a thump as something solid landed on the deck. She looked around, eyes streaming. It was a statue of a woman, clad in pearls and scales, rising out of a cresting wave. Juvia was clinging to it, her tiny arms wrapped around the woman's neck. The monster gave a pained roar and moved towards them once more. Then Levi saw the statue's eyes began to glow, and, along with them, Juvia's eyes turned silvery white like pearls in dark waters. The tiny mage thrust out her hand, and a geyser of water erupted beneath the lunging monstrosity, slamming into it from behind and pushing it down. Water streamed from the statue and flowed into Juvia, wrapping around her and gently lifting her from her perch. They wrapped around the water mage like a suit of shimmering silver, and then seemed to flow into her. There was a flash of light, and then Juvia's feet touched down onto the deck. 
She was bigger now, Levi realized. The water mage had finally returned to her original size. She was dressed in a gown of iridescent fish scales that flashed every color of the rainbow. Levi glanced past the mage and realized the dress mirrored the one carved onto the statue. My lady. Ishmael breathed reverently, stepping out in front of her and bowing low. Juvia looked at the ghost and smiled. Then she raised a hand and the ocean surged to follow her command. Tendrils of water wrapped around the thrashing monster and began to lift it upwards. It rose higher and higher, until its body was pulled completely out of the water, held suspended over the ship in a bubble of water like some kind of gargantuan fishy Christmas ornament. Levi stared, now that she could see the whole thing, she could understand why none of their spells seemed to do much to seriously hurt it. It had to be at least ten times the size of the ship. But suspended in the air like it was, its limbs flailing uselessly, it didn't seem so threatening. Juvia stared up at the creature for a moment and sneered like a haughty queen looking down at a mouse that dared to invade her bedchambers. She raised her hand and snapped her fingers. At once, the bubble holding the monster began to boil, the water hissing and roiling so much as to obscure its prisoner from view. All Levi could make out was a blurry, thrashing shape. Then, after a minute had passed, the thrashing slowed down, then grew still. Juvia waved a hand dismissively and the bubble floated off, touching down into the water and gently sinking from sight without a splash. Then everything was quiet. My lady. Ishmael murmured, looking up at Juvia reverently with a wide smile on his face. Juvia looked at him and smiled. She bent down and pressed her lips to his forehead. The ghost let out a sigh and seemed to fade away. His trident clattered to the deck. Juvia turned to look at them, a serene smile on her face, she nodded to them all and the glow faded from her eyes as she blinked. W what? Juvia asked, pressing her hand to her forehead. What happened to Juvia? She went inside, and it was all smelly and, what is Juvia wearing, she blinked down at the dress of pearls and scales. Before anyone could answer, the ship beneath their feet lurched. Levi looked around, the ghostly glow that had surrounded most of the ghost ship was fading and bits of timber were beginning to fall off and sink. All around her, the abducted people were shaking their heads and looking around. No time. Levi said, raising her light pen and writing a boat into existence. Come on guys, we need to get everyone onto the boat. Juvia, you need to carry everyone. Here to shore. Juvia looked at her, then nodded. Tendrils of water rose out of the ocean and wrapped around the bewildered townsfolk and tourists, and depositing them, dripping but unharmed, onto the raft. Yo, boss. Levi turned and saw Jet standing behind her, he was panting lightly and he was soaked, but he looked unharmed. Um. I'm not if I believe what I just saw. But I think we won. Yeah. Levi smiled. I think so too. S and D S and D S and D S and D. So, Jet said, shoving another pretzel into his mouth and crunching it as the carriage rumbled. We went to save people from a ghost, found the ghost, got attacked by a sea monster, rescued a statue from the monster's belly, Juvia became a goddess, killed the monster, put the ghost to rest, and saved all the people. One for the books. Droy agreed, snatching the bag of pretzels out of Jet's hands and fishing around in it. He glanced across the carriage. So Juvia, he said, shoving a pretzel into his mouth. How did it feel to be a goddess? Juvia can't remember. She huffed, all she remembers is diving down the monster's throat and following the sound of a voice. She found the voice and hauled it back the way she came. After that, the next thing Juvia remembers is waking up on the sinking ship wearing this dress. She gestured to herself and the glimmering blue-green garment of scales, stretching out her legs. You know, you could have gotten something else to wear in the town before we left. She could have. Juvia agreed. But Juvia rather likes it. It makes her feel powerful. 
Yeah, Jet nodded. I can see that. You look very pretty, Miss Juvia. Wendy said, she was sitting next to the water mage, clutching Carla and looking happy. Thank you, Wendy. Juvia smiled. Yeah, Droy grinned. Wait till Grey gets a load of you. He laughed as the woman turned red and began to splutter. So, Wendy, Levi said, looking up from the phoenix chick in her lap, it was getting bigger by the day, she'd need to get a bigger bag. What did you think of your first mission, as a member of Fairy Tale? You people are reckless, dangerous hooligans. Carla declared. I liked it a lot. Wendy answered. The cat's head whipped around to glare at her and the girl shrugged apologetically. Sorry, Carla. But it was exciting, we never really did anything like this when we were part of Kate Shelter. She turned to Levi. Are all of your missions like this? Nah? Levi smiled. Some of them actually get pretty crazy. Wendy's eyes went wide and Levi laughed. Still can't believe Gajil kept that ghost captain's trident. Jet commented, glancing up to the roof of the carriage. I mean, like, what's he gonna do with it? Eat it? Who knows? Droy shrugged. I just know I'm not about to try to take it away from him. True, true. He probably would have thrown a tantrum. Something thumped against the roof. I can hear you, idiots. Gajil's voice grumbled in through the window. Sorry, buddy. Jet called up. Just having some fun. I could literally nail you to a tree and leave you for dead, and there is nothing you could do to stop me. I think he had fun too. Jet commented, making Droy nearly choke on a pretzel. Levi smiled. All things considered, the mission had gone well. But she couldn't wait to get back to the guild and hear what had happened in her absence. She wondered if they'd had as crazy a time as they'd had. Daddy Issues The guild doors swung open to reveal and bedraggled Goku and Urza stumbling around with their arms over each other's shoulders. They walked right past the staring guild members around them carefully deposited themselves into chairs side by side at the bar. Launch took a single look at the pair, clicked her teeth, and walked over with a pair of oversized beer mugs. Well, monkey boy, I see you don't have a sword in your chest this time. I'm guessing that talk went well, she said, dropping the mugs in front of them. Urza directed a deadpan stare at the bartender and wordlessly accepted the mug. Her other hand came up with the exact change for her favorite item on the menu. Goku passed over his entire wallet and pointed wordlessly at the noodle section of the menu. Launch snagged the money with a chuckle and wandered off to fetch the requested cake just as Master Makarov hopped up onto the table. You kids seems to keep finding yourselves in all kinds of trouble lately. I'm starting to get worried that you're going to bit off more than you can chew one of these days. Makes an old man worried. We don't mean to worry you, master. Urza replied. These situations seem to find us just as often as we find them though. But we are your S-class elite for a reason, you don't need to worry about us too much. Regardless of who challenges us, or what anyone says about us, we will pull through in the end. Makarov sighed and brushed off the young woman's attempts to comfort him. This guild has been threatened with annihilation nearly a half. Dozen times in just the last year, let alone the council trying to shut us down. I trust you to look out for yourselves, but I wish that you didn't have to. The world just keeps getting more dangerous, no matter how many foes you knock down. The council has gotten irritated enough, that they have started asking me for permission to send along an observer to witness the S-Class trails at the end of the week. I think they are trying to figure out just how strong we've gotten over the past few weeks and whether or not it would be in their best interest to make another attempt at trying to rein us in. HMPH. They can try if they wish. We don't have anything to hide from them. Makarov quirked an eyebrow and looked pointedly at Goku's tail. Of course, of course. He nodded amiably. 
nothing here that could overthrow the entire government at his leisure at the request of his best friend, Wright. The old man snorted quietly to himself as he hopped off of the bar top and started his way towards the second floor. Don't you kids worry, I'm sure that as long as you stand together, you'll pull through over anything else. Just stop making me worry so much. I'm old, my heart can't handle stress. Launch placed the food down in front of the pair and watched in amusement as Goku's food quickly began to vanish from sight. Urza's cake sat quietly in front of her untouched as she watched the elderly master disappear into the upper floor. I think I shall be accompanying you and Kagura from now on once you restart your training, rather than it just being an occasional thing. We need to become far stronger than we are. Of course. Goku said with a wide grin. Then the smile grew wider to show off just a few too many teeth. Just as long as you think you can keep up with us. Even through her exhaustion, Urza felt her hackles rise at the challenge. You think yourself stronger than me Goku. Yep. If you can't use the Fei thing, that means you are weaker right now. I may not be able to go past Kaya Ken, but that's until my body manages to patch itself back together all the way. You can't use your boost at all. Maybe you should try Kagura first. Did you just insinuate that I would struggle in combat against a ten-year-old? What? She's a really strong kid. Goku exclaimed. Urza sighed. You are that eager for me to pound your face into the dirt? She asked. Goku tried and failed to look innocent. After lunch then. With the trials right around the corner, it couldn't hurt to begin working immediately. We shall not waste even a single moment. The girl said seriously. You best take this seriously though, for I shall not be made light of. She declared with her finger pointed right at Goku's face. Splat. Caught up in her talk as she was, Urza completely missed Lucy sneaking up beside her, grabbing her cake plate, and flipping it straight up into her unsuspecting face. The instant the pastry landed, Lucy bolted straight for the door, screaming as she went. I may saw really san and dimadiba tandalostanch made me thizement how fi reala didn't want her p-l-e-a-s-e-d-o and to kill me. Kana watched in complete disbelief as Lucy vanished out the door, looked to see Urza slowly rising to her feet, and then booked it out of the room herself. Lee's Anna would soon hear about the event and the blurted confession, and wouldn't feel safe less than five feet away from her older sister for the next three days. Before Urza could begin her pursuit, Launch dropped two more pieces of the cake down in front of her, along with a towel. Come on Red, give the kid a break. It was just a prank, no harm done right. The sheer stones it must have taken to pull that off, just let it go for now, right? If you really need to, just save it for that trial coming up. Urza swiped the towel away from the blonde and wiped off her face. She sat back down with a huff and began shoveling food into her mouth. Goku took a single look at her expression on her face and turned back to her food. At the very least, their spa would be an intense one. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
to do with you at all. It's just, it has to do with why I joined the guild in the first place. My dad. Your dad. You've never really talked about family before. Did he send you to join the guild when he died or something? No, that was my mom actually. She told me when she fell sick that I should go track my dad down at Fairy Tale, and that he would love me and take care of me when I met him. I'd hardly even heard of my dad before that, so I was kind of excited. I'd finally get to meet him, you know. But then I found out who he is. Kana had sighed, sinking a little deeper into the sea of bubbles. He's not a bad guy, not really, but he sleeps around so much that I can't help but wonder if I'm just one of a whole lot of kids that he's left behind all across Führer. I don't think he'd do anything like that maliciously, but he's so absent-minded. I had no idea whether or not he'd accept or reject me after that, and I got too nervous to try and talk to him. You honestly think he might reject you? Kind of. I know, in theory, that he isn't the kind of guy who would just ignore it outright but I've got no idea what he might actually do. I somehow got it in my head that I'd just wait for the right moment, that I'd do something amazing enough for him to notice me on my own merits, and then I could reveal that I was my daughter after he had already accepted me. So what did you try to do? I kept trying the S-Class trail. I thought if I joined all the other young powerhouses, that he would acknowledge me for sure. Instead, I set a new guild record for most failed promotion attempts in a row. Four straight years. The young woman chuckled darkly at herself. I barely even get what I'm doing here anymore. I mean I love our guild mates, and I wouldn't trade you for the world. But, what am I doing here? I know I should just go in and talk with him at this point, but I'm so scared of what will happen that I can never get myself to move. I've stalled out with my magic. I haven't gotten any stronger in months. At this point, I'm starting to think I'd be better off just giving up and getting away from all this. What do you say, Lou? Want to run away with me and start up a little bar somewhere quiet? But, come on, Kana, it really can't be that bad, right? Why do you think your dad would even care about how strong you are? I don't know for sure, I really don't. But with how strong he is, I can't get the thought out of my head. I mean really, how could I ever even come close to someone with as much power as Gildart's? At the time, Lucy had just barraged Kana with praise for her magic, promises to support her for the upcoming trails, and everything that she could to convince the part-time drunk that she didn't need to leave the guild in order to figure herself out. Now though, Fresh out of an alternate dimension and a few panic-filled days wondering if she would ever see Kano again, her priorities had gone through a rather abrupt shift. So now, Lucy had an entirely different plan in mind. Lucy didn't use her silver key spirits nearly as often as the golden ones, not when the gold was so much more powerful, but with how little strain the silver spirits put on her nowadays, and with Crux's ability to know anything about what the spirits or their summoners had done or were doing, it made for a useful, if slightly tiring set of days for the blonde. Every morning, Lucy sent out her spirits and then spent the day conserving her strength the best she could in the guild hall. Kana was more than happy to keep her company, even if she didn't know just why Lucy kept looking so tired. On the third day, Crux appeared next to her just as she was finishing off her lunch. Mistress Lucy, the spirit said, I'm pleased to inform you that Nikora has found the one you requested we seek. He is awaiting your arrival outside the limits of this city. I would urge you haste, for Nikora is unsure how long he shall be able to stall. He reported. Lucy had already grabbed Kana and started dragging her towards the door before he had even gotten half of the words out of his mouth. Whoa, ah, Lou. Where are we rushing off to all of a sudden? Who's this mystery man your spirits are stalking? Kana asked as they rapidly made their way through the streets. Okay, I know it's not the best to just spring this on you, Lucy explained, dodging around a group of people. But I've been having them keep an eye out for your dad. Lucy's arm jerked as Kana dug her heels in, 
grinding them to a halt. Lou? Kana said, her face scrunched up. Don't get me wrong, I know that you're just trying to help me out, but really. What the heck? I'm not ready to confront him like that right now. Yes, you are. Kana, you are tough enough that you get into fights with demons while drunk. You have effectively replaced water from your life with alcohol, and you haven't died. But most importantly, you managed to get me out of my own head. Lucy stepped right up to Kana and slowly wrapped her arms around the slightly taller woman. You dragged me out of depression kicking and screaming, Kana. You didn't care how messed up I was, you just grabbed on and didn't let go until I could smile again. So now, we are going to go out into the woods where Plu is probably running around with your dad's stolen belt or something, and we are going to find him, and we are going to find out what he thinks about having a daughter that can drink him under the table. Lucy said resolutely. Kana bit her lip and nervously wrung her hands. Seeing the hesitation, Lucy grabbed her arm once again and began gently pulling her towards the woods. But, what if he doesn't care? Or if he gets angry? Mom told me that he'd care about me, but it's been so long, would he be upset that I kept it from him? Kana asked quietly. I can't promise that everything will turn out perfectly. Lucy said slowly. Family isn't like that. My mom passed away when I was young too, and then my dad was always too busy running his business and worrying about making more money to ever care for me. But Gildarts is a fairy tale mage, right? Family is kind of our thing, right up there with property damage. But even if I'm wrong and things go horribly, I'm still going to be right here with you. Got it? You didn't leave me, so I won't leave you. Just try to get rid of me. See what happens. Lucy finished with a small smile on her face. Right, right. Okay. Kana reached into her pocket and pulled out a little handle of vodka and downed the glass in one gulp. Lead the way, Lou. Let's get this done before I lose my nerve. Just try it. I'll kick your ass. I already said okay. Kana scoffed. Calm down. I will not. Lucy grinned and took off at a jog through the rest of the city and lead her friend down one of the dirt roads built around the city. The two made their way deep into the forest, far enough that they were well out of the sight of the response team, who was normally on standby watching for Gildart's approach to move the city out of his way. It took Lucy a little while to figure out where exactly Plu had ended up. She had sent the little canine spirit to patrol a couple of ways into the city, so tracking him down again took slightly longer than she would have liked to admit. When they did, they were greeted to the sight of the strongest mage in fairy tale sitting cross-legged and watching intently as her littlest spirit did a complicated jig. I see. Gildartz nodded as Plu did a black flip. And then what happened? Poon. No. Poon. Gildartz whistled. And I thought I got up to some crazy stuff. He shook his head and caught sight of them. He stood up as they approached and gave each of them a wide grin. Hey, Kana. Don't suppose that friend of yours happens to be a spirit mage, is she? The red-haired man asked easily. Somewhat surprised, Lucy gave a hesitant nod. This little guy is yours, right? Gildartz pointed at the white spirit. I recognized him as a celestial spirit, and I kind of figured that he might have wandered off and gotten lost on you. I've kept an eye on him for you. He tells some wild stories. You can actually understand him. Lucy asked, then shook her head. No, that was not important. Never mind. I appreciate it. Lucy smiled at the man in return, and not so subtly began to push Kana forward. But I actually sent the little guy out to find you. Lucy said, carefully keeping her voice light and bubbly. She couldn't afford to make Kana even slightly more nervous now. Oh? Did you need me for something? The man asked. 
I haven't been banned from entering Magnolia again, have I? Ah, uh, no. Actually, it's Kana that wants something. She has something important to discuss with you. She said, then carefully took a few steps back out of the way of the pair. I'll be hanging out right here in case she needs me, but this talk is between the two of you. Gildartz shrugged and turned his attention to the brunette, who was now worrying her hands once again. Seeing her nerves, he shifted his posture to something as non-threatening as he could manage, and subtly used his cloak to hide his mechanical pieces and the evidence of some of his more gruesome wounds. Hey there kiddo, it's not like I bite or anything. Take it easy. Take a breath, calm your thoughts, and just tell me what's up. Kana nodded shakily to herself, gathered up her courage, and blurted out a single word. Cornelia. Gildartz blinked, his jaw dropping. That's, how do you know that name? I haven't even talked about her with anyone for over a decade. I, ah, uh, when I was a kid, my mom got sick and passed away. Before she did, she told me that I needed to find my dad. She said that he was a mage at Fairy Tale, and that he'd take care of me when I found him. But when I got there, and I found out that he didn't even know he had a daughter, and I got too scared to say anything. I ended up spending a few months in the town's orphanage before I joined the guild officially. Kana's gaze slid off of the stunned look on Gildart's face and down to her feet. What, you, but? Gildart stuttered, his eyes wide and bulging. His attempts at sentences fell apart into garbled noise, and in his hesitation Kana forced herself to press on. Then I could never work up the nerve, and kept putting it off again and again until I was a grown woman and still too scared to do something. I, I know that this is totally out of the blue for you, and that you had no idea about any of this at all, but I finally had to tell you. It was driving me insane, sitting on this as long as I did. I'm sorry you had to find out like this, so long after the fact. I, ah, uh, I understand if you want to just ignore this past today. Her gaze still on the ground, Kana began to step away, back towards Lucy. Not matter how much she might have wanted to, she couldn't bring herself to raise her gaze and look at her father's face. I wouldn't blame you. I, just this once, I wanted to be able to call you dad. Kana voice broke and she spun around, ready to dash off into the woods. She made it half of a step before a warm hand closed around her wrist and pulled her backwards into a tight hug. Kana found her head pressed tight against Gildart's side, enough so that she felt the tears trickling down from his face into her hair. Her arms hung limply at her side and eyes were wide in disbelief at the sudden emotion. I never knew. I swear, I never knew. Gildarts declared. If I had known, you would have had a home from the moment you set foot in Magnolia. I would have taken care of you and protected you no matter what. The man squeezed her tight once more and then pulled her away, with an arm on each of her shoulders so that he could look her square in the eye. Cornelia was the only woman that I've ever loved. The man confessed. We were childhood sweethearts, and we married fairly young. Those were the best years of my life. But then, when I developed my magic into what it is today and started taking more of the longer and more dangerous jobs for Makarov, I couldn't spend enough time with her anymore. She felt that I was neglecting her, when I wouldn't cut back, she decided to leave me. I came back from a mission one day, and half of our things were gone and there was a note on the table telling me to find her when I got my priorities straight. I jumped into the jobs even worse than ever after that. Got it in my head that if I burned through enough jobs, I'd be able to make enough money that I could retire young and spend the rest of my life with her. Then, she died. I didn't even know that she had gotten sick. The man trialed off and began roughly scrubbing tears from his cheeks. So, you don't need to worry about justifying yourself to me. If there's anyone that understands regretting poorly made decisions more than I do, I've yet to meet them he said bitterly. But so long as you'd have me, I'd like to be in the life of my kid. 
however much you want, whatever way you want. But if I'm a dad, if I've been a father all this time, I can't just let you walk away again like it's no big deal. I mean. He held her at arm's length, uncertainty clouding his face. If that's all right. For the first time since she had stepped into a forest, the tension eased from Kana's shoulders. With a shuddering breath and a quick swipe of her hands to dry her own cheeks, Kana smiled at her father. Ah, yeah. I think I'd like that. Gildart's smile turned massive and he yanked the girl in for another hug. The two clung to either other for a long moment before Kana pulled herself away again. Okay, so, ah, uh, something else we should probably get out of the way. Lu, see Mir. The woman barked behind her. Lucy, who had been rather intently studying literally anything besides the emotional reunion going on beside her, looked over with a sheepish grin and stepped up next to the brunette. Dad, this is my girlfriend, Lucy. She said, throwing an arm around the blonde. She's the one that finally got me the nerve to talk to you. Gildartz blinked and looked Lucy up and down. This is your girlfriend, he asked. Yes. Kana answered, her eyes narrowing. Gildartz whistled. That's my girl, he raised a hand toward Kana, as if asking for a high five, then paused. Kana had buried her face in her hands and Lucy was pretty sure she could feel steam coming out of her ears. It occurs to me. Gildart said slowly. That I have just done something very awkward. Yes. Kana groaned. Very. I'm going to put my hand down now. You do that. Kana said, not looking up. Sorry. Well. Levi did tell me that parents could be embarrassing. Kana mumbled. I could try to do dad jokes instead. Gildartz perked up. I always wanted to try those. No. Okay, okay, too soon. Time for that later. Gildartz shook his head and smiled at Lucy. Well, thank you very much young lady. He said sincerely. Knowing this, it means a whole lot. So, thank you for supporting my daughter when I couldn't. It's not a problem at all. Lucy said as her face returned to normal temperatures. With how much she's done for me since we've met, I couldn't not help. Gildart smiled. So, I bet you both know why Makarov's called me back here, right? Either one of you going for the S-Class trail in a few days. Going to be trying again, Kana. Oh, ah, uh, maybe not this year. Kana said uneasily. I, ah, uh, I had been using the trial as a marker for when I was ready to finally talk to you. I was planning on confronting you when I had an S-Class title of my own. I, I thought that if I was already an S-Class mage when we talked that you'd be more likely to be proud of me, that there'd be less of a chance that you'd turn me away. Oh? Gildart said, looking unsure what to say. I would never have done that. I think I know that now. Kana replied. But I just got stuck in my own head for so long. She shook her head. I think I'm going to step back from it this year. Try and get things sorted, train myself up, and make sure that the next time I go for it that I'm really ready. Really ready, huh? Gildartz mumbled to himself. Humming in thought, the man began fishing through his pockets. You know, he said thoughtfully. Once I started developing my magic, Makarov strong-armed me into writing everything about it down, to take notes. Said that with how scattered-brained I am, I'd forget details about how to use it and end up making it impossible to teach it to anyone else if I didn't have instructions somewhere. He scowled lightly. I'd resent him for that if I wasn't so darn sure he was right. Finally finding what he was looking for, Gildartz pulled a small, leather-bound journal from his belt. The man reached down and grasped Kana's wrist once more, gently turning her palm upwards and pressing the book into her hand. Take this. Kana and Lucy eyed the book like it was live grenade. Dad, 
Did you just give me the keys to using your magic? She asked hesitantly. Hum, sort of. This thing is pretty bare bones. It would take some crazy work and a good idea of my head to get to where I am from just that. Even then, if you don't have the enough power behind you, it's going to be about as effective as slapping people with a fish. But I've seen you in action before at those trails power definitely isn't something that you lack. Consider it my way of making up for all those missed birthdays. With that, you can learn how to do what I do. He paused, his face suddenly becoming serious. Do not let Natsu see that. I'm not an idiot, Dad. Kana answered, rolling her eyes. Ah, you must get that from Cornelia. He grinned. Can someone really learn magic like yours just from reading a book? Lucy asked, skeptical. Of course not, Gildart snorted. But it can teach you the principle. Then, after the exams, I can come back and train YA. I'll get you doing my style in no time, and help you polish up your own style while we are at it. He rubbed his hands together gleefully. You'll train me. Kana looked up. Of course. I've heard it said that the parent is supposed to make sure that the child surpasses them. That's something I've got to see. Gildartz grinned. Just you wait, Kana, when I'm through with you, fairy tale is going to have a new strongest woman. Memory manipulations vs cognitive recalibration. Five days to S class trials. Day one. Requip. Urza cried out. Silver wings burst from her back and a swarm of swords went flying Kagura's way. The preteen threw out her hands and tried to use her gravity magic to spike the weapons into the ground. Despite her best efforts though, Urza's control proved superior, and the weapons continued on virtually uninterrupted. Grimacing, Kagura brought up her sword to try and fend off the attack when suddenly Goku appeared in front of her and screamed. The Kiai exploded forwards scattering the blades in his path and clearing the way to Urza, who was now sporting her lightning empress armor and sparking wildly. Kagura went to charge at the redhead and was instantly met with a backhand from Goku, whose eyes had never left the redhead across from him. It's a free for all Kagura. Goku chided mildly. Don't get so focused on one opponent that you completely ignore the other. Kagura coughed an agreement, as she tried to pry her back and out of the splintered remains of a tree. She pulled herself back to her feet and saw Goku still standing near her, a barrier up to fend off Urza's lightning, as he stared back at her. Kagura met his eyes and nodded slowly. I understand. She declared. Goku smiled. His lesson given, the warrior blitzed towards Urza at top speed. Taking his advice, the younger swordswoman immediately charged straight for his back. Day 2. OOF. Urza grunted as a sudden gravity well caught her off guard and halted her charge. Kagura's lips curved upwards at the move and flipped. The gravity of a boulder behind her back, sending a ton of stone hurtling straight towards the redhead. Urza's body flashed and the giant armor caught the projectile barehanded before shattering the stone to powder in a single strike. Kagura went to follow up, but caught a glimpse of orange out of the corner of her eye. As Goku leapt at her, he suddenly found his gravity turned off. The man yelped in surprise as his momentum carried him far over his target, and then over the tree line. The brunette got a half second of satisfaction, before she was forced to parry a sword thrust with her sheathed blade. Urza pressed the attack, and though Kagura was skilled, the redhead completely overpowered his strength and put Kagura on the back foot. The two traded rapid blows at a blistering pace back and forth, but no matter how she struck Kagura couldn't find an opening. Then Goku came swooping in from the sky on the flying Nimbus, KI blasts flashing, and the two were forced to dive aside to escape the bombing run. The duo leapt and dodged as dozens of explosive bolts crashed rain down on them. Urza was the first to counter, unleashing a squadron of swords upwards at the little wave of KI. Metal met energy and the air filled with shrapnel. 
Goku was forced to shield his eyes and in that moment of distraction, a gravity well slammed into him. The magic ripped Nimbus out from underneath him and sent him hurtling towards the ground far faster than nature ever could. He tried to right himself, but then a sheath slammed into the back of his head and sent him tumbling to the dirt. Kagura landed hard behind him and tried to charge in, but Goku was already back on his feet and caught the weapon with his bare hand. The two fighters smirked out one another before twisting out of the path of Urza next attack. Day 3 They were at a farm. Urza wasn't entirely sure why. Kagura was looking around with a pained expression, so she at least had some idea why Goku had dragged them there, but the man in question had wandered off to speak to the property owners with a promise to quickly return. With him nowhere in sight, Urza turned towards the nervous-looking girl. So, I don't suppose the fool has given you any clue as to what today's training shall be? She asked the young girl. Kagura shook her head slowly, looking nervous. Is something the matter? Urza asked. Well, it hasn't happened that often, but sometimes he says he gets inspired by something and will make up a brand new training method. The last time this happened he disappeared for an afternoon saying that he was going fishing. The next day, he took me out to a giant salt lake a few miles from the coast and told me that we were going to be doing some long-distance swimming to work on our speed and endurance. We had to do ten laps back and forth across the lake, and then we could take a quick break before doing it again. That doesn't sound so bad. Urza said. Kagura looked at her. When I got in, a huge shark suddenly rushed me and tried to bite me. When I went to kick it, Goku blocked me and told me that we could only dodge them, not hurt them. Them? He put twenty of them in the lake before we got there. They hadn't started attacking each other yet, but I don't think there were any more fish left before we got in. So, the two of us swam for most of the day, back and forth across this lake dodging sharks for hours before we could go home. When we were finished, I nearly fell asleep on the beach, and he just went out and grabbed the sharks one by one and carried them back to the ocean. I see, and you fear that today might be something similar. It might be. I overheard him complaining that there weren't any dinosaurs around for him to use, whatever those are. The young girl sighed. But whatever it is, I'm sure it will be worth it. I haven't stopped getting stronger since he agreed to train with me. Yes, you are quite powerful for your age. I am sure that once you are grown, you shall be quite the incredible warrior. You could quite easily surpass us. Urza said honestly. Then a small smirk pulled at her lips. If we let you that is. HMPH. The small girl pouted. I'll beat you one day. Both of you. Sounds like a fun challenge. Goku cut in as he landed between the pair. The two girls jerked in surprise at the sudden appearance. Neither of them had been watching the skies for their comrade and had completely missed Nimbus passing by overhead. Get as strong as you can Kagura. I'll be down for a match with you whenever you want, especially once you've grown up. He said happily, ruffling the girl's hair. Kagura's previous pout returned with a vengeance. Urza hid a chuckle behind her hand and tried to bring the reason for their visit back to the forefront. So, Goku. Have you completed your discussion with the farmers? Is your mystery training session all arranged? Oh, yeah. These guys, they've been wanting to expand their farm for a while. Plant some new crops and stuff. So, we are going to spend the day making a new field for them. A new field? Urza asked. How are we going to be doing that? Well, to start off. Goku fired off a pair of small KI spheres that darted out across the property and into the woods that stood beyond it. The two orbs went off in different directions and began to burn a rough square into the ground around a few square miles of forest. We need to clear away the trees. The farmers said that they'd be happy to get some extra firewood too, so we are going to go through and pull them all up by hand. No using any powers, 
Just rip them up and then bring them back over here so that we can put them in a pile. Urza looked over the dozens upon dozens of trees grouped together in the space, then down at the vaguely contemplative look on Kagura's face. Sensing a potential issue, the redhead decided to try to somewhat divert her friend. Are you sure about that Goku? With that many trees, lunch might be delayed for a while for us. This could go a fair bit faster if we used our abilities, otherwise we might lose time. Both Goku and Kagura looked confused. What are you talking about, Urza? We should have this done well before lunch, and then we can move on to plowing the field for them. Plowing? I didn't see you bring any equipment over. Urza stated. Nah, we don't need anything like that. We are just going to be doing lunge walks up and down the field, punching the ground really hard. We'll turn all the rocks to dust, and the plants to paste so whatever they plant here can eat the old stuff. We are going to be punching the entire field into shape. Urza's tone was filled with incredulity. I know, it's not that much of a workout after doing all the tree pulling, so I got us some boulders. Goku cheerfully gestured off to a trio of rocks sitting away off behind them. We'll tie those to our backs so that we can get a bit more of a workout in, all right. Urza's concern for Kagura spiked. Was this how he trained her all the time, or was this something that he had cooked up special since she was here as well? Urza turned towards the woods, fully expecting to see Kagura struggling with her assigned task, only to get nearly bowled over when the young girl came running over, a massive tree perched precariously over her shoulder. The preteen slammed the first of the trees down in the lumber pile and glared at the two older fighters. I will not do this myself. Come, there is work to do. She declared before going back for the next tree. Smiling, Goku followed right after her. Urza watched the two for a moment, studying the pair. Then a smile just as wide as Goku's grew across her face, and she went to go join the pair. It seemed there wasn't anything to worry about after all. She cracked her knuckles. Except, perhaps, that they might not be able to keep up with her. Day 4 a picnic. Kagura asked, looking around for a hint of what that would actually entail. She didn't see any enormous monsters she'd need to kill and butcher, so it didn't look like she'd be securing the food herself. No, no. Goku waved a hand. An actual picnic. I swear. The day before the S class trails were supposed to begin for Fairy Tail, both Goku, and Urza had agreed that their training could afford an off day. Instead, the two had taken Kagura out into the woods down a small forest trail, where they had met up with Simon and a massive basket full of food. Ah, don't worry about it Kagura. There's nothing wrong with taking a step back and relaxing before a big event. The trial is tomorrow, and at a certain point training is more torture on your body than it is helpful. We are better off just having a quiet day and making sure that we are ready. I'm not even in the trial tomorrow, and you and Urza will only be acting as obstacles, not taking full part in the trial. None of the fighters who are supposed to participate can match you evenly, and even if they could this isn't a life or death event. Couldn't tomorrow be your easy day, and today we could keep training. Simon hid his smile behind his hand, as he watched Kagura definitely not beg and pout like a kid denied a favorite toy. He was sure that she wasn't even aware of how she looked, otherwise she would likely have forced her face impassive once again and started acting like she was his age instead of her own. Don't worry Kagura, I'm sure that we'll find plenty for you to do after the test is done. Goku placated. After this is all wrapped up, we'll be able to ramp up your training even more than before. Kagura stared at Goku for a long moment, contemplating his words. Then, with a nod, she marched over towards the picnic basket, snatched up the largest sandwich that she could find, and plopped herself down directly between her teacher and her brother. Rolling his eyes, Simon briefly met the gaze of Goku and Urza both. The trio all smiled at one another over their youngest members. Head. Despite what Kagura had been told, 
she would be a bit busier than she might have expected during the coming day. Training wasn't brought up again for any of the hours that the group spent together. Instead their time was spent eating food, swapping stories, and laughing together as the sun lazily traveled across the sky and the shadows grew long. The four didn't depart until the stars were out and the sounds of the nocturnal creatures filled the air. Goku went to bed with a smile on his face. With selection day tomorrow, some interesting fights were right around the corner. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Makarov would promptly pack them up to use as kindling for his fireplace. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
then at the obvious adoration on Urza and the rest of the mags, then back to Urza. He met Kagura's eyes. Kagura nodded. He nodded back. Goku brought up his hand and gestured towards Urza's ear. Curious, the redhead leaned in so that Goku could whisper to her. Carefully, Goku reached out, then grabbed her by the back of her head and slammed her head against the table so hard that the wood shattered and she continued right onto the floor. This time, the room took one quick look at who was clashing, then quickly returned to minding their own business. Urza pulled herself off of the ground with splinters in her hair, fire in her eyes, and magic crackling across her body. Thick metal gauntlets burst into existence around her hands, and then promptly buried themselves deep into Goku's gut, practically bending the fighter in half. Goku coughed up a little dribble of blood onto the ground, smiled, then grabbed Urza's head and jerked it around so that she was looking straight at the dark-haired man across the hall. The second her eyes met him, her body froze, and her gaze turned glacially cold. The woman's entire body started to tremble, but Goku's hand clamped down around her wrist before she could take a step. Heat rolling off of her like a nuclear meltdown, Urza's head slowly twisted back over toward Goku like a tank aiming its cannon. Goku met her rage with a passive face and Kagura stepped in between the pair as well, putting her hand on Urza's free arm. Her stare tracked back and forth between the two for a tense moment before her eyes slammed shut and she began sucking in oxygen. Deep inhale. Deep exhale. And the eyes snapped open. Fine. The woman hissed, her body like a coiled spring. Plan. Now. Cognitive recalibration. Goku said, looking her dead in the eye. The girl scoffed loudly before looking at around the room once again. At least Kana and Lucy haven't come in today. Before we do that. Do either of you recognize him? Never even felt his energy signature before. Goku said quietly. I see. Urza hissed. You two, sit here and wait. With that, Urza was up and moving, making a beeline straight for the bar. Kagura shot Goku a quick questioning look, but the fighter silently shook his head. With Urza's expression like that, she had a plan and any attempt to go with something different would be, resisted to say the least. The best the two could do would be to jump in if they saw an opening. Urza stalked straight up to the bar, scowling angrily, as she waited for Myra Jane to finish passing food over to another mage. Eventually, the white-haired woman noticed her pseudo arrival's demeanor and carefully made her way over to stand across from her friend. Urza is something dash that was as far as the takeover mage got before Urza's fist came across the bar and punched her straight through the wall of alcohol behind her and into the kitchen. All sound in the guild came to a sudden stop. Urza straightened herself up, crossing her arms over her chest as she waited impatiently. Myra Jane did not keep her waiting long. The light in the building dimmed as Satan's soul burst into the world. The demoness stalked through the hole she had just created, glowing with an unholy aura. Glowing eyes met Urza's own furious gaze. Urza flicked her eyes toward the stranger and Myra followed suit. Her gaze fell back over towards Urza as the redhead donned her giant armor. Urza gave just the slightest of nods, then made a far more obvious gesture with one finger. Myra Jane nodded back just as slightly, then allowed her power to flare even darker. The bar promptly exploded. A massive piece of counter flew through the air, catching Joy in the face and knocking him straight in jet. Urza completely ignored the screams of her guildmates and charged in, swinging the giant's sword with such force that it sent another group of mags flying. All too quickly, a number of mags jumped into the battle from around the room and the entire guild hall fell into chaos. Purple flames, massive burst of energy, painted creatures, energized wood, and a host of other powers were sent flying to the room, smashing into one another and to practically every mage around the room. Bodies were sent hurtling in every direction, the walls gained new holes every second, 
and the roof began to moan ominously as the guild went from quiet to full-out brawl in just under ten seconds. As rowdy a bunch as fairy tale was, every last person quickly was dragged into the fight save for three. Goku and Kagura watched like hawks as their target backed himself away from the brawl, looking more distinctly uncomfortable and confused with each passing minute. Anand, now. Kagura couldn't even follow his movement. One instant, Goku was standing beside her, the next he was besides messed with both of his fists clenched together. Bump! He cried out as he smashed the mage straight over the melee. He made it halfway across the room when Myra Jane appeared beneath him and slammed both palms straight into his gut with a cry of set. Gasping in pain, the man floated up into the air, practically touching the ceiling. Before inertia could take hold though, the man felt a flare of bloodlust to his left and saw a flash of red. Spiike. The roof of fairy tail exploded outward with the force that Mest was struck. The man flew so quickly through the air that none of the fairies were even able to hear, as he went screaming off into the distance and vanished into the sky with a twinkle of light and a soft ping. The matter settled, Boza descended back into the guild hall and barked out. Halt! The force of the woman's voice paralyzed all but the toughest members of the guild, and just as quickly as it had begun the guild-wide brawl was dragged to a halt. Listen up everyone. Urza ordered. We have, at best, thirty minutes until the master arrives. We are going to need everything cleaned up and back to normal by then, she paused for a moment. What are you waiting for? Move it. The mags erupted into motion. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
This year is going to be slightly different than the last test. To begin with, I recently found out that my eighth candidate will be refusing the chance to advance in favor of training herself into the ground and cleaning house next year. So, for this year only, we'll be hosting a field of seven contestants. Second, unlike previous years, we are going to be altering the first round. Unlike previous years where you test taker and their partner go the whole way through, all of the partners will be placed at the exit of the first round. Each candidate will have to get through the first round on their own. The guild erupted into quiet mutterings at that. The guild was famous for comradery and their teams, for confronting a challenge individually felt, strange to say the least. Makarov took the sudden discussions in stride and continued his announcements. Lastly, I want you to tell me your partner right here and now after I call your name. I want to get a full head count before I get off this bar. This was met with less mumblings, but still mumbles all the same. Makarov smirked. It did the brat some good for him to catch them off guard every now and then. Made him feel like he was still doing his job, as the eccentric old master. All right. Quiet down you lot. The first participant will be. In an instant, he had the entire guild hanging on his words, and the air thick with suspense. Grey fullbuster. A smattering of applause echoed around the guild as Grey stood up and directed his attention towards the S-class floor. Lucy immediately noticed his gaze and began shaking her head at him. Whoa, whoa. Sorry, Gray, but I don't really want anything to do with that test right now. He's not asking for you, Princess. Light gathered behind Lucy as Loke materialized. The lion spirit adjusted his clothes as he smiled. Gray and I had a promise going back a few years. As you know, promises are quite important to us spirits. He leapt down to Gray and gave him a fist bump. Good to see YA, man. Gray grinned. Is that allowed? Freed spoke up. Loke is not, strictly speaking, a mage. He's a member of Fairy Tale. Makarov said dismissively. Secretly being an eldritch being from beyond the stars doesn't free you of that. You make it sound like a cult, old man. Loke laughed. One of us. One of us. Several of the fairies started chanting. Exactly. Makarov grinned. That's one pair settled. Next up, Natsu Dragnil. Applause rang out once again, and Natsu quickly turned to his blue-haired companion with a face filled with excitement, but before he could say anything a hand grabbed onto his own. Need a partner, Natsu? Lee's Anna asked happily. Ah, sorry Lee's Anna but I was going to be pairing off with. You? He's pairing off with you. Happy chirped. Up? What? Natsu looked at his best friend in confusion. Happy. I'm sorry, Natsu. The cat shook his head. As your friend, I have decided that you need to expand your horizons. I hope you understand. He finished solemnly. Then Myra reached over and slid a plate with several grilled fish on in front of the cat. Oh? Natsu said sourly. I understand all right, you furry little sellout. Natsu, Lee's Anna said in a tone of injured innocence. Are you saying you don't think I'm good enough to be your partner? Natsu's eyes went wide. Ah? Uh, that I'm not good enough for you. Lisanna's lower lip trembled. I I didn't say. For shame, Natsu. Happy said around a mouthful of fish. You're such a brute. I I I. Lee's Anna leaned over and whispered in Natsu's ear. This is the part where you say, of course not, Lee's Anna. I would love to have you as my partner. Of course not, Lee's Anna. Natsu said mechanically. I would love to have you as my partner. I do. Lee's Anna smiled, patting the dragon slayer's cheek affectionately. Yes, yes. Makarov cleared his throat. Come on brats, 
Do all of you really need to have a song and dance about choosing your partner? Next, Levi McGarden. The applause this time were immediately drowned out by the sounds of the other two Shadow Gear members immediately starting to bicker over which one of them Levi should take for her partner. The word mage watched for a few moments in exasperation, and then, just when it looked like the two were going to be coming to blows, she turned to look out over shoulder. Hey, Gajil. Want to see if we can top the pirate adventure? She asked. The metal man blinked at her, then gave a feral smirk. You keep lining me up good fights, and I'll keep knocking them down for YA. Levi smiled at him happily, very deliberately ignoring the aura of depression that had cropped up besides her. There, see. Makarov said. How hard was that? Next then, freed Justine. The serious mage ignored the attention turned his way, and instead looked between his two potential teammates. After a moment of silent contemplation, he simply announced Bixlow. Then returned to his drink. Evergreen immediately saw red. What was that? Evergreen demanded. You didn't even hesitate. I'm every bit as strong as the doll freak. Freed nodded. I assure you, Evergreen, your strength has absolutely nothing to do with why I don't want you as my partner. What? Oh, that is it. Who's the next person? I'm going to pant up with them, then we're going to beat you too and win the whole thing. Makarov chuckled at the outburst. On that note, what do you say, Elfman? Think you can handle Evergreen as your partner? The burly teen stared at the fiery-eyed mage for a few moments before grinning widely. Someone filled with such a manly fire for victory, how could I refuse? Excellent answer. Makarov cheered. Did he just call me manly? Evergreen demanded. As I said, an excellent answer. Makarov repeated. Now, let's hear it for our next contender, a former S-class mage herself, Juvia Loxa. Huh? Juvia looked up from the bar at the sound of her name as everyone started clapping. What is it? Juvia wasn't listening. She was busy thinking about what she and Gray will name their children. Wow. Loke said, she really just went and said that out loud, didn't she? He smirked at his partner. Way to go, tiger. Shut up. Gray groaned. You need a partner for the S-class trial. Makarov explained. Oh, Juvia turned to Gajil. I'm already the bookworm's partner. Gajil snorted. Pay attention, woman. Erm? Juvia turned to Sue, who was sitting beside her. Sorry, babe. Sue laughed. The S-class trial is a bit out of bows and my league. Erm? Juvia turned to the guild at large, eyeing everyone. Then something fell down from the upper balcony and splashed into a glass of water on the bar. There was a burst of light and a mermaid materialized in the guild hall. I shall be her partner. Aquarius declared, looking down her nose at the rest of them. What? Lucy demanded. You throw a fit if I ask you to do anything even on your contract days. And you volunteer for her. Is that allowed? Loke asked. I mean, she's never even been a member of Fairy Tale. Excuse me, Tomcat. Aquarius scoffed. If you have a problem, why don't you try to stop me? She raised the urn she was clutching, the water inside sloshing ominously. Well, now that I think about it. Loke said quickly. Being contracted to Lucy makes all her spirit fairies by proxy, doesn't it? Um? Does Juvia know you? Juvia asked, looking at the water-bearing spirit. In a manner of speaking. The spirit sniffed. I am going to be your partner in this endeavor. I have already decided it. Okay. Juvia nodded, still looking confused. Well. All right then. Makarov said. Moving on to our final contestant, whose name was added next then, 
by the recommendation of two of our S-class mags despite her age, Kagura Mikazuchi. The guild's smallest swordswoman blanched at the announcement. Her eyes immediately darted over to her two tablemates, both of who were smiling happily at her. Whatever it is she might have been about to say to them, she suddenly choked it down and smiled right back at them with slightly watery eyes. I will show that you haven't misplaced your trust. She said as seriously as she could manage. Just do your best. Goku said. I think you can handle it, but you better watch out. Your competition is looking fierce. He smiled, looking just a little bit envious. You will crush them all. Urza smirked. Kagura turned unlike the vast majority of the mags in the building, Kagura had not spent nearly as much time as she could have outside of her own friend group, and though so far virtually all that she had befriended had either been already entered into the test, or had opted out of participating altogether. Kagura scanned the room for anyone to catch her attention. Who could she partner with? Who would be a good option? After nearly a minute, Kagura spotted Wendy. The littlest dragon slayer was probably the only person in the guild that was around the same age as her and had been sitting alone ever since Mest had been thrown out of the building. Hemming quietly to herself, the gravity mage slowly walked across the room, coming to a stop right before the blue net. It was only when she got there and Wendy looked up at her that she realized that she didn't know what to say. Wendy looked awkwardly around the guild, then her eyes went wide as she realized what was happening. Wordlessly, she met Kagura's gaze and pointed at herself as if to say, Really? Me? Kagura nodded and held out her hand. Hesitantly, Wendy reached out and clasped it. Then, somewhat uncertainly, the two nodded at one another and pumped their arms a single time. H.M. The next generation sure is moving quickly. Makarov said. All right, brats, if you are competing or if you're involved, head for the boat. We are pulling out. It's time for this year's S-Class trail to get underway. S-Class, opening act. Makarov waited patiently on the ship's deck as his children lugged their gear and equipment up the gangplank. Foremost, it was a simple overnight bag and the occasional sword or other weapon. For Urza. Come on, Scarlet, you're holding up the line. Myra Jane called from the dock as the woman in question carefully balanced two crates on either arm as she tried to shimmy up to the ship without allowing anything to fall into the water. Shut it, Myra Jane. Do you have any idea how much my equipment would rust if I allowed it to touch salt water? I am going as fast as I safely can. Okay, firstly. Your gear is magic. Why is it not rust-proof? Second, you can literally make them all float with your mind. Every single person here right now could probably just chuck the entire thing straight from the dock onto the deck. Half of us could literally fly them dash, Mira Jane's mouth snapped shut. Groaning to herself, Myra Jane drew out enough demonic power to take on her wings and floated herself straight past Urza and onto the ship. A few seconds later, there was a series of thumps onto the aged wood as the rest of the guild followed her example and hopped up on board. Gesturing towards her siblings, Myra Jane started to make her way towards the door to the lower deck, but before she could slip through the frame, a large calloused hand blocked her path. Mira Jane's eyes slide sideways to the arm's owner, and her good mood quickly soured. Laxa stood before her, a solemn look on his face. The Phantom Lord thing. I don't think the two of us have willing said a single word to one another since then. Laxa said loudly. By the third word, every single eye on the boat was aimed at the pair. I'm not going to insult either of us by apologizing. We both know why I said what I did back then, and why I'm not going to bother trying to defend myself. Behind the pair, Elfman was whispering into Lasana's ear as quickly as he could, explaining the situation. The youngest Strauss quickly sprouted fangs and claws. But, I am going to tell you this today. My perspectives are no longer what they were that day. 
My opinions on strength and on the guild as a whole have changed. So, whatever it takes in the future, I'll win back the trust of you and everyone else in this little family of ours. With that, the lightning mage stalked off towards his grandfather, not once looking back. Myra Jane watched him go for only a moment before turning her attention right back towards her siblings. I suppose we have that to look forward to in the future. How do you two want to make him grovel? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Sometime he liked to just sit back and bask in the wild energy that ran free across the island. It had a way of pumping him up that only the prospect of a challenging fight could match. But, there was a blank spot. Goku frowned. On an island that teemed with the very essence of fairy tale's wild soul, there was a spot with nothing in it. Or perhaps a spot where he couldn't sense anything. A sort of dead zone. Goku's brow furrowed. There were spells that could block his KI sense. Levi had specifically designed one just to see if she could. But, only Levi and a handful of other mags in Fairy Tale actually knew enough about the skill to cast such a spell, and he couldn't think why any of them would feel the need to hide something on the island, or when they would have had the time. He tried to focus his senses even further, hunting for any trace of what could have caused the dead space. Then, as he watched, a second circle of blankness erupted into existence elsewhere on the island and he realized that it wasn't that something was blocking his senses, it's that everything in the space was dead so that there was nothing to sense. He could feel it as all the life within the space just instantly keeled over. But even as everything died, he couldn't sense anything, not so much as a single trace of what could be causing. Knock knock knock. Goku's reach vanished with the sudden appearance of Urza at his door. The young woman took one look at his serious expression and walked over to sit on his bed beside him. You appear unsettled. Urza noted, raising an eyebrow at him. Goku shrugged, still staring in the direction of the island. It's... I'm not sure. I was practicing the range of my KI sense to pass time a bit and I felt some weird dead zones on the island. Like something's killing the plant life over there. I see. Urza's gaze turned sharp. Can you feel what might have caused this? Is there someone else on the island? I don't think so. I didn't feel anything but the plants and animals that are usually there. Nothing else. I see. Urza frowned. If it's not a mage, it may be some kind of recurring curse. Such things are inevitable in places where powerful mags start throwing magic around. We should inform the master. I would imagine that he should at least be able to identify the problem, if not solve it outright. If it is something to be concerned with however, hopefully it will wait until we complete the tests. Our friends have been working far too hard for today, I do not wish for something to ruin it. Goku nodded and started to pull himself off of the bed, only for Urza to yank him right back down. We can inform him when we are preparing to depart Goku. There is nothing that he can do about it until we arrive, and that's going to be ours yet. Better to just let him focus on any last-minute preparations he might have for the test instead. Urza explained. Rather than giving him a chance to respond, the woman simply tightened her hold on him and shook her head. Stay here for now Goku. I'm taking a nap, and you shall be joining me. We can deal with everything else when we wake. Goku hesitated for a moment, before eventually allowing himself to be pulled towards the pillow. As he lay though, he couldn't help but reach out with the KI towards the island once again. Miles away, a man sighed in defeat at the pack of dead wolves at his feet. Yet another pile of corpses to add to his list. But still, he was spared the punishment. But still, he lingered. He was not certain why he had come here. Something about this island was calling him to it, even more than just being the resting place of the spirit of his beloved. There was something in the air. A feeling of impending conflict. Something was coming to this island, something absolutely teeming with life energy. He didn't know what it was, but he did know one thing. He would be quite glad to meet it. Perhaps it would give him the sweet release he craved. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
and they owed it to the mags taking the test to ensure it ran smoothly. Whatever the problem was, it would have to wait until the evening to be investigated. Unhappy with the answer, Goku still couldn't do much to counter the old man's point. He had to admit that if, when he took the trial, something had caused a delay for him having a shot at Gildarts, he would have been annoyed. Still, he was fast and with Nimbus there was no question that he could be duck away, do some quick investigation, and be back before the first trial started. As he touched down in the clearing of Blackened Land, he saw that the dead circle was even more lifeless than he had originally expected. The trees inside of the zone were petrified fossils, as devoid of life as any stone on the ground. The grass had withered to the point that it turned to powder with a slight breeze, and the small pack of wolves that had apparently been inside were all cold and lifeless. Goku slowly looked around the area, searching for any signs of what might have caused the deaths. Everything had been frozen in the moment of death, and he could see a patch of powdered grass in the center of the clearing that was flattened. Something was sitting here. The fighter wondered, eyes narrowing. Unfortunately, without anything to sense, and without any other prints in the grass, there was nothing that he could do further. With a sigh of disappointment, Goku took to the sky and made his way towards one of the higher branches of the massive tree. Once he found his position for the first test, he settled down to wait. He might not have been able to sense anything, but he couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching him. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the lightning lacrima flared up like a spotlight towards the very center of the room. Natsu's grin split into a wide grin as he spotted the dark cloak and the mop of red hair. Hey Natsu! Gildarts grinned, waving lazily from his seat. Who better to teach a little upstart the meaning of crushing defeat than the one true master of crush magic? Elfman's Gate Elfman approached the entrance to his trial with his head held high. But the master was not the only one watching. High above, hidden in the treetops, just beyond Elfman's clearing, Myra Jane sat in the branches of a tree, her fingers lazily tracing a magic circle in the air to calm her nerves. She had been the one to design the trial, but now that it was about to happen, she had to force herself to sit still and only watch. She forced down her misgivings and snapped her fingers, releasing the magical chains she'd set up in the cavern. An echoing screech split the air, and a giant form surged from the cave. A massive form of sinew muscles and talons, with the body of a lion and the head of the eagle that gave off sparks as it moved, a thunder griffin. Myra Jane had found brought it here herself a few days before and brought it to the island. They were a powerful monster, considered to be in the lower levels of S-class monster ranking. A fierce opponent, although one she had no doubt he could best physically. But defeating it wasn't the trial. She hoped Elfman had stopped to read the little note that she had carved next to the entrance to his testing chamber. Leave stronger than you enter. The monster blitzed forwards as Elfman came through, only to be instantly met face to face by the beast. Her brother roared in challenge, and the other creature paused as the beast met its gaze. That moment of hesitation cost it, as the beast fell upon it, forcing it to the ground and pummeling it into the ground. The griffin let out a furious shriek, and thunder surged from it, sending the smell of burning hair wafting through the air. But Elfman roared in defiance as he smashed his fists down over and over again, practically digging a grave for the monster with its own body, as he forced it further and further into the ground. As powerful as the monster she had caught was, it had nothing against the Führer's ultimate alpha predator. Killing it though wouldn't open the door. The only way for Elfman to leave would be to use a spell that he hadn't used since the worst day of either of their lives. Would he even consider it with the minimal hint that she had left for him? Would he be willing to use it if it even occurred to him? Did she want him to? Myra Jane had spent a good part of the week leading up to the test kicking herself for agreeing with the master to keep her mouth shut about the specifics of Elfman's test. There was every chance that he wouldn't even think to use the spell after so long, and he'd flunk out from a technicality of all things. If only she... Take over. Mira Jane's internal berating cut short in a brilliant white light. The creature that Elfman had pinned screamed and writhed in desperate panic, as its form dematerialized and flowed into the muscular monster man. Elfman shuddered, his body rippling as the griffin covered his body like a mantle. A pair of white, feathered wings burst from his back and his hands became talons. Within moments, it was over. Elfman, or the thing that had been Elfman, stood still, bent over in the clearing. Myra Jane swallowed. Was he still in there? Would she need to fly down there and brutally force her brother into submission once more? But then Elfman stood straight, and his head turned in her direction. He raised one taloned armed and waved before flexing it, showing off his bulging cords of muscle before letting out a triumphant eagle shriek. Then he turned and marched through the opening door. The eldest Strauss couldn't stop her smile as she watched her brother move on to face his next trial. Levi's Gate Levi took it all in with a glance. The battlefield was a small clearing surrounded by trees. There were words inscribed on everything her could see, the trees, the rocks, even the ground. It was a lot to read but the gist of it all was that she wouldn't be able to influence the area with her own words. Her script would have to overcome the charm on each and every square inch of whatever she tried to use her powers on to have any effect, doable, but exhausting, and she wasn't stupid enough to try. In the middle of the clearing, a seven-foot-tall stone golem, absolutely covered with all sorts of enchantment-resisting charms, high strength, high durability, 
heavy magic resistance, but slow in both speed and reflexes. Really, she said, realizing immediately what Makarov wanted from her. This place was designed to resist all enchantments. There would be no tricky plans, no brilliant works of magic. Just her, and an enemy she would need to face head-on and defeat through only her own strength. You want me to do a Goku? She said, raising an eyebrow. Well, he was an S-class, so clearly his methods had to have something to them. She could augment her own strength and wear down her stone opponent through a war of attrition. But? Sorry about this, but I think I'd rather save my energy for the other two rounds. The word mage said easily as the golem began its advance on her. A few quick swishes of her pen had her body flowing with energy. Her muscles hummed pleasantly as the power coursed through her, easily allowing her to dodge the giant's first swing. She stepped easily around it, surveying it from every angle until she had a rough estimation of its makeup. Overall, decent craftsmanship. In terms of brute force, the thing would likely be able to give Elfman a bit of a hard time. But she'd used to spar with Goku, you couldn't do something like that and not pick up a few tricks. All that meant was that she needed to do a bit of extra work on its joints before she could be sure that it would fall over. Sidestep, kick to the back of the knee. Sidestep, kick punch combo to the elbow. Hop over the top, elbow to the back of the neck on the way down. The girl fought more like a surgeon than a mage, just using precise shots at weak spots one by one. With each blow, the magic holding the stones together on those all too vulnerable joints degraded just a bit. It took three minutes and just over a hundred strikes, but the golem fell without doing anything but wearing out the sole of the word mage's boots. She passed through the doors to the second round with her head held high. Gray's door. Ice make, lance. Gray roared, shooting out a javelin of frozen water. The attack passed straight through the throng of ephemeral spectres. The ghosts, long grey figures with translucent skin and wickedly pointed claws chittered and swept down on him. The ice mage cursed, leaping away and firing more blasts of frost and ice. Makarov shook his head. Much as the young man might be loath to hear it, he was like Natsu in many ways. Powerful and resilient, with an almost peerless mastery of his chosen magic. And while Makarov could not reasonably say that he was not quite as simple-minded as the Dragon Slayer, he was certainly every bit as stubborn. Faced with an enemy, his only focus was on defeating them. A mindset common amongst his brats, but not one befitting an S-class. While force was often what an S-class had to use to complete a mission, it was not necessary. Knowing when not to fight was equally important. The message he'd left for the Ice Mage had been simple, make it through the gate. The ghosts weren't particularly dangerous, but Grey also lacked the skills to hurt them. A fact that seemed only the more obvious the more blasts of Ice Grey threw their way. Well, eventually the brat would realize that they wouldn't have given him an unwinnable challenge and think it through some more. Ice Make, Glacier Makarov settled back into his chair with a sigh, trying not to think about just how many of his mags would likely fight to the point of exhaustion before checking to see if the door was unlocked. Juvia's door. Juvia's case was a little bit strange. In Phantom Lord, she had already been an S-class mage, had completed S-class level missions. In truth, she didn't even need to take this exam. When an S-class changed guilds, their status was rarely revoked, the difficulty of the missions weeded out the mags who couldn't handle it quite quickly. But Juvia had insisted that she not retain the rank, stating that she didn't want to make her darling Grey feel intimidated, or that she was out of his league, or, well, frankly he'd tuned her out once she started rambling about the Ice Mage. And that was Juvia's biggest weakness, not that she felt love for others, but that she allowed her emotions to distract her far too easily. An S-class mage had to be able to stay focused on the task at hand. If they didn't, you'd have situations like when Gildartz almost wiped a city off the map because he sneezed funny in the middle of a fight. 
he didn't need any more incidents like that, thanks. And so, she was facing off against a golem, clad in armor similar to Urza Sea Empress armor, an opponent designed to both resist Juvia's powers, and possessed weaponry capable of inflicting at least some damage to her watery body, but nothing she couldn't handle. The problem was all the pictures of Grey in varying degrees of undress they'd hung on the walls. Makarov watched as the golem stabbed its trident into her while she was staring wide-eyed at the collage of greys. She counterattacked, but the water blast seemed more an afterthought than anything else and the golem was unfazed. The golem raised its trident and sent out a burst of lightning that surged around the chamber. Makarov heard Juvia shriek through the scrying pool and frowned. Had she truly been taken down by something so simple? He squinted at the pool and saw that the mage was still standing and, rather than looking particularly fried, she was still staring open-mouthed at the cavern walls, where the lightning had set half the pictures on fire. Juvia turned slowly toward the golem and raised her hand. The maelstrom of water that followed the action left the golem crumpled on the floor, its waterlogged armor broken and unusable. Makarov sighed as the door opened and Juvia waltzed through, though not before snatching a few of the remaining pictures and tucking them into her clothes. Well, love was distracting, true. But he would be the last to deny that those who fought for those they loved were always the strongest. He could only hope that, if she did win the trial, she wouldn't wash any cities off the map because someone told her they didn't think she and Grey were a cute couple. Freed's Door Freed was an uncompromising mage with a magic bordering on unfair. But he was at his most powerful when he had time to prepare his battlefields. One problem many S-class mags encountered was their fame. With their abilities expounded upon and explained in tabloids across Führer, dark mags often tried to take advantage. You never knew when some crafty B-lister would set up a trap turning your magic against you. Freed staggered backward, chest heaving as his lungs tried to take in air. He gasped as breath suddenly returned to him. Runes appeared above the scripture mage's head. Beyond this point, all mags must walk on their hands or lose the ability to breathe. While Makarov didn't believe in holding grudges against his brats, he would be willing to admit that sometimes he took pleasure in ironic punishments. For the past few years, Every so often Makarov would find himself stuck in rune traps, or have his things booby-trapped, or have items suddenly be replaced with rune fakes that would do some minor annoyance on contact. His grandson's right-hand man taking offense whenever it appeared Laxus wasn't getting whatever respect the lightning-brained brat felt he deserved. Makarov had mostly ignored it in the past as near harmless, but when life gives you lemons. He watched Freed scowl and raise his hand. There was a flash of light as he rewrote the runes over his head. Then the chamber lit up as a new line of runes appeared. Mags under the age of 80 who use rune magic in this chamber impose a five-minute time limit on themselves to complete the trial. Makarov allowed himself a slightly vindictive smile. He wasn't a spiteful man, really. But it was important for an S-class mage to appreciate just how terrible their powers could be in order to instill a sense of responsibility in how they use them. Besides, Freed still had a chance to succeed. There were only, oh, another two or three rules he needed to adhere to so long as he didn't do anything stupid and spring the nasty ones. He could, oh. Makarov frowned as the maid shook his head and turned on his heel, stomping out of the chamber the way he'd come. Looks like he'd given up. Makarov rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Giving up and storming out the moment things turned against you. It would seem Freed truly was following in Lax's footsteps. Well, hopefully Laxus was genuine in his efforts to better himself, and maybe he could bring Freed up with Bim. Kagura's door. Kagura came out on a hilltop, well clear of any kinds of trees or natural barriers. The path leading to the next section was obvious, a path through the trees on the far side that was being blocked by a glowing red barrier of some kind. As for her opponent, there was nothing but a sign in very center of the field. Kagura cautiously approached, 
keeping an eye out as best she could read it with her blade at the ready. Range duel. Survive or strike back. Kagura looked at the sign, down at her sword, then back at the sign again. Then she looked around at the distinct lack of anything that she could launch with her gravity anywhere within the boundaries set up for her. There was not. The young girl sighed in annoyance and began to push her magic downwards, searching for anything that she could pull up and fire should the need arise. Far across the island, Goku was sitting in a lawn chair that he had set up on one of the upper branches in the island's massive tree. All ten fingers were splayed out, pointed down at the nice clear area that Kagura was standing, like a sniper aiming down the scope at an unknowing target out of cover. He wondered if this is how Biska felt before she shot rampaging monsters in the face. He could feel the anticipation rising as K.I. began to build in his fingertips. Goku grinned. The first warning that she was under attack came when the sign exploded. The sudden spray of splinters forced her eyes closed, leaving her blind for the swarm of eight K.I. bolts that very deliberately landed in a tight circle all around her and blew her straight up into the air. Finally, the tenth met her at her apex and blasted her straight back through the cave that she had entered from. Goku gave her a two-count and then promptly abandoned his position when the cave entrance exploded. Hundreds of tons of stone were suddenly lifted up into the sky and fired randomly towards the massive tree like a giant shotgun blast. Goku t scared. Had she even tried to sense him? Firing blind like that was just wasting ammunition. He raised a hand and blasted a few stones that looked like they might shear off one of the tree's branches, while the rest went hurtling far over the horizon. Goku retaliated with another barrage that sent Kagura sprinting across the field, swinging her blade widely to bat them every which way as she tried to pinpoint exactly where he was firing from. Her eyes darted all across the massive expanse of bark while her senses reached out for any trace of Goku's K.I. Goku dropped his K.I. down as low as he could, only bringing it out in tiny bursts to shoot down at her too quickly for her to catch. This wasn't like any of the spars that she had with Goku leading up to this event. She'd always had to deal with him out in the open, his K.I. flaring like a signal beacon and this sudden change in fighting style threw the young woman off completely. She couldn't even try to follow the shots back to them. Goku had learned from his spars with Alzac and Biska all those years ago, and his blasts curved around to arc toward her from every angle. If she made it through this, he'd start bouncing them off the ground to hit her from behind. Goku grinned widely. Now he knew why Biska always had such a big smile on her face before a fight, this sniping business was actually kind of fun. He'd need to. Kagura crouched as the barrage suddenly off. The girl stood tense and ready for just over three minutes, not moving a single muscle until time ran out and she was cleared for the next door. Slowly, she lowered her sword, a furious frown on her face. What had that been? Had Goku just handed her the round? Had he, held back? The thought of it filled her with fury, but there was nothing to be done about it now. She grit her teeth as she marched through the door. She would have words for him when this was all said and done. Far away and high above, Goku had turned his back on his student to stand face to face with a young pink-haired woman who had joined him on the tree. All thoughts about the test long gone as she advanced on him, her palms glowing with magic and murder in her eyes. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
SND back for another omake. Writing these are fun. Enjoy. S and DS and DS and DS and DS and D. The first thing you do to access the power of crush is summon your magic. Gather every piece of it within yourself and condense it into a ball, tighter and tighter so that none can escape your will. Then you must shape your magic into a hammer. Next, picture the rest of a world around you as a bunch of nails made of glass. In what way, Lucy groaned. Is that helpful advice? I'm not sure what we were expecting. Kane aside, fingering her hip flask, she hadn't drunk anything today, the day was about her studying Gildart's, her father's magic. This was, in a very literal sense, her birthright. She wanted, for once, to be sober. But the way Gildart's notes were written was sorely testing her resolve. I mean, she said glumly. This line of thinking explains so much about him. Before the flute thing, Magnolia's buildings were literally built on rails so that they can be slid out of the way so he wouldn't accidentally walk into one and reduce it to rubble. Wait, seriously? Lucy asked. I've heard people been saying that, but I thought they were joking. Kana shook her head, her awareness of her hip flask's presence rising by the moment. Surely one little sip wouldn't hurt. We live in a city with hundreds of wizards and that was the best solution they could come up with. That's just how Gildarts has always been. Kane aside. We used to use this sort of, she waved her hand vaguely. Set of bumpers we'd put on his shoulders and warn him before he bumped into a building. But he kept vaporizing them. Lucy frowned. And I thought my dad's personality was problematic. Hey. Kana answered feeling that she should at least make an effort to come to her father's defense. Gildart's never meant to blow up anyone's house. And he always paid for the repairs out of his own pocket. I mean, that's nice. Lucy answered, squinting at the cramped writing in the notebook. But still. The people of Magnolia are very tolerant. I'll say. I'm amazed they haven't run us out with torches and pitchforks. Me too. Kana nodded. They fell silent, staring at the notes. Well, Lucy said at length. Why don't you try again? Just channel your magic into one spot, and then try to shoot it out. That's what I've been trying for the past three hours. Kana groaned. So far, the most she'd been able to do was reduce an entire pack of magic cards to ashes. If Gildart's power was as easy as throwing a bunch of magic at something, every fairy would be as strong as him. That's fair. Lucy nodded. But you have the advantage of being his daughter. Magical aptitude is, to a limited degree, genetic. Why don't you try not using the cards? Maybe that will help. If you think it's a good idea. Kana pulled her hand away from her flask and stuffed the few cards she had left into her purse. She held her hand out to the boulder in front of her, closed her eyes, and took a deep breath. Her dad's notes were beyond stupid. But, he was also stupidly strong. So, maybe she really should just try approaching it from that angle. Kana gathered her magic, reaching for every scrap she could lay her hands on. After a few minutes of quietly simmering, gathering every scrap she could, she could definitely feel something. Some kind of force bubbling within her, a magic begging for release in a way her cards had never been able to give her. She just had to let it out. S and DS and DS and DS and DS and D. Gildarts hummed to himself, idly examining his nails as he waited for Natsu to come bursting in to see him. He felt a little bad about the harsh lesson he was gonna teach the kid. Natsu had always been such a cheerful guy, so eager to fight him, and it would be a shame to beat him down in such a way. But Natsu had never understood just how much Gildarts had held himself back whenever the boy annoyed him enough to agree to a sparring match. Welp, the kid was going to learn very soon. Hopefully he'd take the hint. Bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
BZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZZ
About an hour. Before I could even make it back there. A, hey, are you sure? He nodded furiously. I'm sure, Pumpkin. Ah, uh, no. That nickname was terrible. He needed to come up with something better. Lucy will be just fine. Just, just make sure all of her stays in one place and that none of them get carried off by a hawk or something. What? Kana shrieked, the image blurred again, as she dropped the lacrima, and the projection cut off. Gildartz opened his mouth, but the call had ended. Should, should he call her back? No. Probably not just yet. She'd have her hands full. The mage squirmed in the sudden quiet. Was, was what had happened his fault? Maybe he shouldn't have given her the guidebook without him there to help her through it. But, he sighed. Well, it was too late now. The problem was out of his hands. He'd call back before the sun set, and hopefully it would be resolved. There would be nothing stopping him from making things right once the trial was over. S and DS and DS and DS and DS and D. Card magic, house of cards. Kana shouted, pouring out her remaining cards and assembling them into a house that came up to her waist. All right, she said, clapping her hands grinning a too wide grin. Listen up, all you little Elus, I'm gonna need you all to step inside this nice little house for an hour or so. No big deal, I just need you all in one place for just a bit, okay? It'll be fun. The horde of Lucy's looked at each other, then one stepped forward and raised her hand. Um, Kana, she said, her voice a little higher pitched than regular Lucy. Yes? Kana said with forced cheer. Should she just start grabbing by them by the handful and shoving them in the house? Lucy would forgive her, surely. You realize that, while we're smaller, we're not actually any dumber, right? The Minilu asked. Like, we're not Natsu. None of us are gonna go running off to wrestle a squirrel or something, right girls? She glanced back at the rest of the Lucy's, Lucy's. Shit. Little Luz. The rest of the little Luz nodded. Giving up a chorus of yes, and don't worry. Oh? Kana deflated a little bit, and sunk down to sit on the ground. Sorry. Lou or, Mini Lucy or. I just thought. Hijinks and misadventures were about to ensue. Yeah? Kana sighed. Well, we are fairies. So, we can't blame you for assuming. As the lead Lou spoke, several of the others took it upon themselves to climb into Kana's lap. So, is this actually what Gildart's magic does? I was expecting something more, explosive. It's one form. He can do it to solid objects, or magical attacks, or anything really. Kana answered, trying and failing to resist the urge to scratch several of the mini Lucy behind their ears. Well, we're not hurt, apparently. The lead Lucy shrugged. So, I suppose let's just count this as a win. You were actually able to use your dad's magic. A chorus of yeah and woohoos accompanied this. Kana smiled, a warm feeling filling her chest. I guess that's true. She leaned back and lay down, grinning as more of the little loos climbed on top of her. It was like being covered in a blanket of kittens. All things considered, not a bad first day of training. S-Class Part 2, Enter Zeref. Makarov stood before all of his test-takers, with a happy smile on his face. Not everyone was as cheerful, Fried stood with his arms crossed angrily, glaring off to the side. His frustration at being the only one to not pass to the second round was not helped by the gleeful smirks Evergreen was sending his way. However, the remainder were satisfied. The six surviving candidates were being given a quick round of snacks and a simple evaluation from the master on their job in the first round. Natsu had lost his fight exactly as expected and had for the first time in his life attempted to retreat. He had gone after Gildartz with everything that he had, tried every trick in his arsenal, and unleashed all of his power only to come up short. 
Gildarts had overwhelmed him with nothing more than magical pressure. The Dragon Slayer had learned a valuable lesson on limits and picking your battles. Whether or not it would stick would be a question for another day. Grey had, after a while of getting smacked around, eventually tried the door and won his challenge. If that didn't teach him a lesson on looking for the simplest solutions and that battle wasn't always the answer, nothing short of a life-threatening battle would. Levi and Elfman had each performed superbly, clearing their challenges within seconds of each other and well ahead of the rest of their guildmates. They had performed their specific tasks well and had proven themselves capable of working around their flaws without issue. Juvia still clearly had problems emotionally speaking, a fact which had never been a question. But her raw power had prevailed, and if he was going to disqualify someone on account of being overly passionate and unreasonable, he wouldn't have any S-class at all. Her heart was in the right place and that's what mattered, but Makarov made a mental note to see if any favors owed to him from around the country could somehow wrangle up a psychologist equipped to calm her down. For Kagura, her test had been cut short. He hadn't seen everything that happened, trying to pay attention to so many trails at once made it somewhat difficult to track, but Goku had clearly cut things short on her. Whatever he had seen that Makarov had missed, it had been enough to convince Goku to pass her then and there, though clearly the girl wasn't seeing things that way, she looked like she was ready to rip off anybody's head if they so much as looked at her. Well, at least Goku would have an interesting time explaining himself once she found him. All right, brats. Time for the second round to get underway. It's battle time. Line up at a random door with your partners and head on in. Levi quickly assessed the doors. They were basically identical, and there was no way to tell which one might hold a magical puzzle, a fight with another team, or something ridiculously unreasonable like, say, Goku, as such. It didn't really matter which one they took. Luck would have the final say. In other words, there was nothing to do but pick one and charge straight through. Come on, Gajil. She called, running straight for one of the cavernous openings. The dragon slayer caught. Up quickly, the heavy tread of his boots echoing around the winding tunnel. You're rearing to fight. The man commented. I'm a fairy. Levi answered over her shoulder. Today's the day I become an S-class mage. I'm ready for whatever fate is gonna throw my way. She sent a smirk over her shoulder. What about you? Do you even need to fucking ask? Gajil sneered, his grin almost feral in the dim light. Don't you worry, bookworm. Whatever is waiting for us, I'm gonna tear it apart. Levi grinned and turned back, spotting a torchlit door ahead of them, they picked up the pace and broke through. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
however unlike them neither of the other two fought alongside another with near animalistic instincts that drove their animal sides to even higher heights. The two, when in cinch could move like a pack, predicting each other's movements and attacking and defending in cinch. Despite his defeat in the first round of the trial, he found himself grinning. With teamwork like that, none of the other teams would have a chance. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
paused, then shut it, looking annoyed. Yeah, that's what I thought. Evergreen sniffed. So here is what we are going to do. You are going to do what I say for this part of the challenge, and then, once we pass it with the minimum necessary effort, thus conserving your strength, you can charge in like the meathead you are in the final round all you want. But Evergreen put a finger to his lips, cutting off his words. Hup, up, up. She shook her head. I'm telling you right now that facing this challenge like a man isn't likely to cut it. You're going to have to do better than that. She smirked, reaching up to adjust her glasses. You're going to have to face it like a woman. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Are you ack? Whatever dramatic speech Urza might have wanted to give, it failed across the board to take into consideration the single most unlike elfman move that the giant man could have done. He heaved a giant handful of sand right into her eyes. Urza sputtered angrily as she poured at her eyes. Furious to have actually been caught off guard as she desperately tried to clear her line of vision. In that brief moment, Elfman had more than enough time to get close. The beast roared as it clamped its hand around her head, bringing her high up into the air before slamming her skull into the dirt. Before he could follow up, blades exploded upwards from the ground. Weapons hidden beneath the dirt exploding upwards at their owner's behest. Elfman scrambled backwards as the metal bit into the beast's hide, drawing forth a bloody roar from the monster. Urza was on her feet in a second, sword in hand, magic flaring and blades spinning through the air around her, as she furiously wiped the grit from her eyes. Eyes cleared, she looked up with violence dancing in her gaze, and locked eyes with evergreen. Urza snarled, raising her sword to strike out at the mage. No doubt she'd been the one to tell Elfman to use such a childish stunt. But, her arm was moving slowly, and as moments ticked by her body grew heavy and the world went dark. She only managed to take a single step forward before her body turned to stone. Evergreen smiled smugly, reaching up to tuck a loose lock of hair back behind her ear. She hadn't taken as much as a single step since Elfman had attacked, which one of them was more deserving of the title of Titania again. It certainly didn't seem the newly made lawn ornament had much to say on the subject. I did not know you could do that. Elfman commented, staring uncertainly at the fresh piece of statuary. Well, a lady needs to keep her secrets, doesn't she? Evergreen smiled. Will Ezra be okay? Ham? Oh? Yes? I'll undo the spell once we are well through the far door. She glanced at the hulking man, who was frowning at the statue, looking almost put out. Oh come on. Evergreen rolled her eyes. Don't tell me you're disappointed with how we won. It was not very manly. Are you serious? Did you actually want to have to fight Urza head on? Well. No. Elfman replied. Then quit complaining. Evergreen sniffed snapping her fan shut with a loud clack. Elfman was silent for a moment, then nodded. Very well. I thank you for your assistance. Let us move on before Urza manages to free herself. As if that's possible. Evergreen scoffed, strolling around the statue and heading for the far door. Do you honestly think it's not? Elfman asked, joining her. Evergreen opened her mouth to answer but her reply was cut off by a soft crunching noise. Looking back, she saw the statue was shaking slightly, and there seemed to be several tiny cracks spreading across the swordswoman's back. Evergreen and Elfman looked at each other for a moment, then, as one, booked it for the door. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he never knew what he was supposed to do. Whether it was those nice lunches she made for him, or just chatting about how his mission had gone, he never knew what to say. He knew what she wanted from him. But that didn't really help him figure out what he wanted from her. Then again, meeting her here was probably for the best. He needed to save his energy for the final round. He could handle Juvia in a fight, their clash during Phantom Lord's attack had proven that. The being said, the bigger problem would be getting her to actually take this seriously. Would she take this seriously if she thought that she was going to offend him? Could he say something to her that would make fight seriously without offending her? How do you convince someone crushing on you to try her hardest to deck him in the face without any additional meanings to it? He was drawn from his musings by a loud smack followed by Juvia's muttering cutting out. The water mage was clutching the back of her head and looking at Aquarius who was glaring at her, hands on her hips. Juvia, the spirit said sternly. Pull yourself together. You are failing as a woman. W what? Oh Juvia, Aquarius shook her head. I take it that this. She glanced at Grey, her look making him keenly aware that he'd lost his pants somewhere in the tunnel here. Deviant, is the object of your affections. Yes. Juvia nodded plainly. Juvia is in love with him. Grey could feel Loke raising his eyebrows at him, and did his level best to resist meeting the spirit's gaze. How the hell was he supposed to respond to that? Ah? Uh, maybe it would have been better if he'd fought Flame Brain in this round. That would have been a lot more straightforward. Then you are going about this the wrong way. Aquarius shook her head. If you desire him, then what you must do is simply make him yours. W what? Dominate him. Aquarius said simply. It is how I began my relationship with my boyfriend. He was an unruly lout who needed my strong guiding hand to set him straight, but under my loving care our romance has blossomed magnificently. Oh, Grey muttered, suddenly feeling an uncharacteristic chill running down his back. I suddenly don't like where this is going. I dunno man, Loke said thoughtfully. I know that sounds bad, but whenever the topic of Aquarius comes up, Scorpio always gets this really happy look on his face. Maybe there's something to what she's saying. Tell me, Aquarius went on. Does he simply ignore you or runs away whenever you attempt to make your feelings clear? Gray, does do that. Juvia said slowly. It is very frustrating. There you are then. Aquarius nodded. Such is the way of a man without drive or commitment. Nonetheless, if he is what you desire, then it falls upon you to make the commitment. Nobody is going to give you what you want, it is up to you to make it happen. Juvia nodded thoughtfully, and it may have been Gray's imagination, but he thought he could hear the sound of the ocean's waves beginning to echo through the cave behind him. Gray sunk into a battle stance. It looked like this was going to be a fight after all. Well, that was good. He knew what to do in a fight. He'd defeated Juvia in the past, but they'd both grown a lot stronger since then. It would be interesting to see how it would play out. Loke, he whispered out of the corner of his mouth. You're stronger than Aquarius, right? Loke's eyes bugged out. Who told you that? Grey looked at him. Didn't you tell Lucy that you were the strongest of the Golden Keys? I mean, yeah. Loke admitted. But, well, ah. Uh, I mean. Oh, yes, Tomcat. Aquarius cut in, staring down her nose at him. By all mean, finish that sentence. She caused the earthen jug in her hands and sloshed the water inside meaningfully. Juvia, dear. Aquarius said. This is your chance to stake your claim. I will, remove, the tomcat from this place for you. Juvia understands. She raised a clenched fist and looked Grey in the eye. Grey, she said, as her hair began to wave like it was underwater and steam began to rise off her body. Juvia wants you to know that what she's about to do to you, she does it out of love. 
Kagura and Wendy emerged in a small grove with a river running through its center. Kagura stood at the ready, her sword and sheath thrust out before her, ready to draw at the first hint of orange. The area was a vibrant green and buzzing with life, but there was no sign of a fist flying toward her at high speed. Um, are you absolutely certain we are supposed to facing Goku? Wendy asked, looking around uncertainly. Of course. Kagura snapped, on edge with the lack of assault coming her way. As if he would let anyone else have the job of testing her. Then, is he hiding, waiting to ambush us? Wendy asked doubtfully, sniffing at the air. I don't smell him around, and I don't really think he's one for hiding. No? That's impossible. Kagura said sharply. The only reason he didn't engage me up close for the first task was to test my ability to fight at range, he wouldn't even think of trying a stealth approach. I was expecting him to charge us immediately and attempt to use our unfamiliarity with how the other fights in order to try and pick us apart. But between his lack attendance here and how our confrontation was cut short before, I'm not sure that he's throwing the fight for me anymore. A trickle of K.I. trailed up around the girl, as she began to reach her senses out across the island. Before her awareness could even stretch beyond her line of sight, a massive explosion detonated high above their heads. Earlier. Goku didn't know who this girl was. He couldn't sense any particularly overwhelming power coming from her. But if she had made it onto this island without Makarov or any of the others noticing, then she wouldn't be some run-of-the-mill mage. He wasn't either. But his capture a few weeks earlier by Altier had taught him a harsh lesson about overconfidence in dealing with unknown mags. His friends were on this island along with whatever it was that was making those circles of death. He would not let himself be careless. He took in her apparel at a glance, her build pointed towards someone who was athletic, and the clothes visible beneath the cape appeared to be made with easy movement in mind. Making a split-second decision, Goku decided on a ranged battle and quickly put some distance between the two of them. The girl didn't pursue, instead forming a swarm of glowing white swords out of the air and launching it straight towards him. A quick Kiai blast shattered the phantasmal blades, and a second sent the girl skidding backwards. She managed to keep herself upright, but for her attention was diverted. Goku's next move was a wave of Kiai that flipped the girl's cape right over her head. She let out a startled yelp and flailed wildly as she tried to rip her clothes from her face. Goku exploited the opening without hesitation thrusting his fist forwards and launching forth an air pressure that knocked the young girl clear from the tree. The pinkette shrieked as she suddenly found herself falling towards the ground, but before she could drop more than a few feet, Goku fired off a couple of donut-shaped rings of K.I. Feet from the ground, the girl was hung up upside down, her arms and legs restrained, her hands trapped inside glowing yellow spheres, and joints bound tight. Goku landed lightly on his feet beside her and carefully looked over her handiwork. While she might be able to break herself free with those ghost swords, there was a little delay when they formed so shooting them down shouldn't be much of an issue. All in all, she was stuck tight. So, who are you? Goku asked. Why did you come all the way out here to attack me? What do you think, bastard? She snarled. Altia went off to find you, to finally finish off her plans to set everything right. But nothing ever changed, she never came back, and you're still walking around without a care. What did you do to her? Where is Altia? The girl's voice got higher and higher with each word, to the point she was practically foaming at the mouth by the end. Altia, huh? Goku mumbled. Can't say for sure what happened with her. 
but from what I was told, she kinda just disappeared after she won. The seething rage on the young girl's face froze, morphing into confused dismay on the final word. She, she won. But, you're lying. If she had won everything would have changed already. My parents would be back, her mother would be safe, would come look after me like a big sister, and she'd make sure that every single tragedy that's gone on since she was a kid was crushed. She was going to be a real hero. What did you do? This time, the rage in her voice was tinged with shades of desperation, and Goku's sharp eyes caught sight of the beginnings of tears in the corners of her eyes. He frowned. Was this girl even involved with the death circle thing? If she'd just come for revenge against him. She might not be alone, but surely any allies would have made a move on him by now. Altia did that time spell of hers, but it didn't work quite the way she wanted. I don't understand how it works at all, but Levi said that instead of going back in time, she are. Uh... Goku paused for a moment, trying to remember how Levi had explained it to him. It's like, ah, uh, two racetracks, that both run the same, but one goes ahead of the other. But then, partway through one of the races gets to go to the start of the other track instead. They know all the turns and tricks so they can do way better, but it doesn't change what happens on the first course. You're just saying words. That doesn't prove anything. It doesn't mean anything. The girl raged. I don't know what to tell you. Goku sighed. She beat us, took my energy, and left. That's what happened, but I don't really think there's anything I can do to prove that. The girl's glare continued for a while longer, only for her eyes to begin to waver. Tears began to leak from her eyes, tumbling to the ground below her. I, I can't, she can't be gone. She can't have left me. The anger bled out of the mage, leaving behind a broken-looking girl, barely entering adulthood. What am I going to do now? The girl sobbed, seeming to have forgotten he was even there. Alti is gone, I can't stay with Grimoire's heart, I can't go anywhere. Goku grimaced as the girl started to break down. This was not his area of expertise, you couldn't punch tears away, and carefully tried to regain her attention. Hey, ah, uh, what's your name? He asked. Mirdi. The girl muttered quietly. Well, um, if you don't have anywhere to go, then you could always try to join a guild or try and find some friends. These heart guys, are they good people? Will they be able to help you out or? Heart guys? The girl spits. Altia and I were just with them to use their resources for their experiments. She always told me that she'd just tear them down when she went back to the past. A spark of life burned in the girl's eye for just a moment, just long enough to deliver one more line before they turned dull once more. You might as well know. They are here on this island too. They've come to find the dark mage Zeref, who's hiding somewhere on this island, and to kill every witness. Far across the island. Zeref took notice of the ship filled with dark mags landing on the shore. Conflict was coming, he could hear its encroaching song like the call of a familiar friend. A conflict that would bring about a change to the world unlike what had been seen in decades. He couldn't tell what it would bring, or who it would affect, but one thing was clear. As this island became a battleground for the beginnings of the New World Order, it would serve as a beacon as well. He was hardly the only one on the planet that would be able to sense the change in the air, and as much as he would like an ending, he still had a single goal that he desired to accomplish as well. It was a goal that he struggled to keep with him over the long stretches of his life, his constant failures and loneliness making the ideas of passing on and leaving it to the rest of mankind more and more tempting with each and every day. His immortality and his inability to circumvent it were the only reason that he still lived to this day. But for now, he still had some motivation in his bones. 
he still had plans in the works. His brother's end. If everything fell in line, E.N.D. would be the answer to every last one of his from his life's remaining problems, even his remaining life itself. Of course, that still meant that Natsu needed to reach that point, and the rest of the dominoes would need to be lined up as well. He sighed. So much to do before he could finally rest. As the darkest mage lost himself to his musing, a lone wolf was slowly stalking towards his back. The old animal had fallen behind its brethren, a weakened knee slowing it down and keeping it away from the rest of the pack. As such, the old canine had been the only one who had escaped Zeref's wave of death. Its fangs bared in a silent snarl, the beast crept up close to the monstrous man and leapt. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
But if you're sure, then you should know that this won't end until one of us cannot rise again. Zeref said evenly. And with the magic I possess, you are the only one here with a life to lose. Underestimate me if you want. We'll find out pretty quick if you're right. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX